Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Awesome People Talk to Andrew here on Pure Mix and YouTube and wherever you happen to be watching. We have the one, the only, the amazing, the my AirPods are not connected and I need to click on the button first. Andrew Shep's with us today. Hold on. Here we come. There it is. Welcome, Andrew. How you doing? Uh. I think I was doing better before all that. Here, wait, What's I got one more for you. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> is this all from your, your plug-in show or is this special for this? It's special for you. I don't believe yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> it's Mark. included stock with the program I'm using, so. Right, that's I saw enough. the button. Saw you can that's tell it really was rehearsed. Cool. Yeah, that's yeah. good. I like it, timpani and everything. Awesome. I think I'm hearing a little bit of the stream back through your, your uh, speakers there. So, um, Well, all right. Whatever. Cool. We did a sound check and it wasn't a problem. Here, I'm going to move the mic closer to me. Yeah. Like that. Yep. Awesome. Audio guys do an audio. That's right. Awesome. So, uh, all right. We are on part 5,000 something. Yeah. Part five. I thought it was and... 4 million, but yeah. You, you, sorry, you had four million in your Instagram, so we'll go and with I had that. the wrong time. So, <laughs> well awesome. done, me. Well, uh, we have a lot of ground to cover. Still, we are doing very bad at moving through your discography, and you made too many records. So, well, you're yeah, welcome. Quite a bit to go through today. Um, the last show that we did was all about Low Roar, and. Yeah was uh really really special the youtube comments on that have been have been really really great from from fans reaching out and stuff and that was that was really fun and awesome of you to do so if you guys haven't seen part four make sure you go watch that it's really cool especially if you're a Loro fan um so we left off in part three around 2007 on right. your records and we were going through your discography a little bit before the show to talk about you know what records we wanted to hit and i want to say to the chat we have uh all of your comments up here and we're watching the chat scroll so if you guys have records that we haven't hit you know we're gonna try and go in order here but if you have records that you have questions about or if you have questions about a record that we're talking about while we're talking about it please do put it in the chat and we'll we'll get it in there to make this a community vibe so That'd be cool. Excellent. All right. Well, let's uh, let's get started. And uh, I know how we could get through this. I'm just going to give you one word answers to everything. Okay. Let's try the first one. You ready? Yeah. My brightest diamond. Awesome. Great. Duke Spirit. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I can't do it. Right. I can't do it. It's I'm still take thirty minutes. I'm going to try not to do the, the tens of thousands of words. Cool. Uh, so, right, My Brightest Diamond. So uh, My Brightest Diamond is Shara Nova. Um, mm -hmm. She's changed her name. She used to be Shara something else. But anyway, it's her project. And she is an amazing musician and singer, fantastic singer. And we'll talk more about her, um, just about her classical singing later on in a different project. But she was in Sufjan Stevens' band. Like they just did a revival of Illinois, which mm -hmm. I don't know exactly how it was, but she was performing in that because they put the band back together for that. Um, and so Bring Me the Workhorse was her first solo record. And she's good friends with uh, an amazing drummer named, um, uh, oh my God, Earl Harvin. I told you the names are not going to come today. I don't know why. Well, probably because I got up way too early. Um, and Chris Bruce, who's an amazing guitar player, bass player, and Joel Shearer, another amazing guitar player, who we talked about because he's the one who started Pedestrian. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm not sure exactly how it came about, but uh, probably just through Joel asked me if I could help get set up for them to make the record because they were going to record a lot of it at his place. He had a, a like rehearsal studio with some recording gear in Hollywood. Um, it was actually a full on studio, not really a rehearsal studio, it had a bunch of stuff in there. And so I went by and I met Shara and kind of set up and we got some guitar sounds and things like that. And then Joel recorded the record and then Earl, I don't know what order things happen on, but Earl put drums on things like that. 
and then I mixed it. And it's a really cool record. Mm. And Cher is one of those artists where she knew exactly what the record was going to be before she started recording down to the order, like absolutely everything. And it's awesome. It's a great, great record. And I mixed that. I think it was while I was doing the Chili Peppers because it was really difficult to get to my Pro Tools rig because hmm. it was like stuffed between the couch that was up on its side and something else. And the Pro Control was sort of sitting on top of things. And um, so I was mixing that album in the box while mixing the Chili Peppers on the console, which I had rented, which we talked about. Uh, and then she came out for, I think we only spent one day kind of doing recalls and, and finishing the record. Um, yeah. And it's a really great record. Everybody should go listen to that record. Yeah. But not so immediately. The name of the record is Bring Me the Workhorse. I don't think we said that yeah. in the beginning there. So yeah, Bring Me the Workhorse from My Brightest Diamond. Um, yeah. And that was, at least on your discography, it's the one closest to Stadium Arcadium. So yeah yeah i mean you never know when these things come out but yeah that was we finished the mixes during yeah that's pretty wild what a that sounds like a very crazy stressful time how was it like working on both of those projects at once well it, the good thing about the chili peppers is they knew things were going to take a long time so we actually had weekends off i think towards mm -hmm. the end and maybe every once in a while in the middle you know i'd work a saturday but always had at least Sunday off and usually the weekend. And mm -hmm. so I had, I'm trying to think, I think I'd spent a good chunk of time on the mixes before the Chili Peppers started. And then it was, you know, on Saturday, I would go out and work on that record. So mm -hmm. it was, it was just compartmentalized. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Not, not bad records to be working on at the same time. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. Well, uh, we're going, that's pretty quick to go through one. Yeah. That's a good start. Yeah, yeah. I think we're off on a good pace here. All right. It, it have. Nice. Uh, chat room, as we go to, if, uh, we'll try and do some Q&A at the end. We always end these with a Q&A after uh, yeah. the brain has turned to mush. So uh, you can feel free to put your questions in the chat roll, and I'll save them for once we get to Q&A, too, as we go. Okay. Next one up that I have on my list is the Duke Spirit, You Really Wake Up the Love in Me, 2007. Yeah. Okay. So that was one song on a record that I think I ended up mixing two songs on and the management got in touch with me, which was very cool. Um, and I'm trying to think, actually, some stuff is sort of out of order, but it doesn't really matter anyway. Mm -hmm. So uh, very, very cool band. Um, I really don't know what to say other than they're a great band. Mm -hmm. And what's that okay they're they're english debbie said to say that they're english british. nice british they're british yeah i think they are english specifically okay. well, but i don't want to impugn them if they're they're welsh <laughs> um so yeah just they're a really cool band and it came out of the blue really i mean the the management like i said just said hey let's get andrew to mix a couple songs and so he did um and it was it was long distance because they didn't come over. So they were still in England. So it was a little, um, there was some back and forth just figuring out exactly what they wanted. They didn't have other stuff mixed yet. So I was listening to previous records, but this record was a little more produced than the earlier stuff. So it took a second to figure it out, but it, it was really fun. Mm -hmm. And then they came over and they played some gigs um, afterwards and I got to meet them and they're super nice. And I mean, we could jump to the album I did with them after, I guess we can just stick with artists or yeah, whatever. Yeah. No, so let's do that. Do... That makes sense. Yeah. All right. So we do that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I mixed those two songs. That album came out. I think it did pretty well. Uh, and then a few, I kept in touch with them and they were, trying to remember exactly how things went. There was some sort of sequence of events where they'd started working on a record in London with somebody. And there was something about it where they got to a point where it was kind of done. But then I got a, a call. It was probably an email at that point, actually, 
to say like, hey man, can you have a listen to this? And uh, oh, supporting Duran Duran, mm -hmm. nice. Mm -hmm. Yes, I believe show. that's the thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They also be ended up becoming really good friends with Gary Newman of all people. Mm. So I think they did some shows with Gary Newman. Um, and so they said, look, can you have a listen to this and maybe, you know, maybe you could uh, have a go at mixing it. And I heard it and it just, you know, I don't want to say anything bad about the way the record was because it was really good how it was, but it didn't feel like the band. They are a noisy, not groovy in terms of like they're doing funk, but like there's a lot of to and fro in the way they play and the beats are there's a swing to them sometimes. And it felt like some of that had been taken out of the record. And so I said, look, I don't think that it's just mixing. I feel like, you know, it's source material. There's something that's not live enough or something like that. And so they were going to come over and we thought that, okay, there's money and we'll go into a studio and we'll do this thing. And I don't know, it just never materialized. And we ended up, we kept, I think we kept two or three of the songs as they were and just mm -hmm. mixed them. But we cut the rest of the album in my studio in LA, which was a garage and the live room was small. And we cut the entire band live. We had uh, guitar amps in the little guest room. We had to drill a hole in the wall to put the cables through. <laughs> Bass was just the eye with uh, Sans amp. Um, there were two guitar players, so we had two little combo amps stacked on top of each other with a board in between to try and act as a baffle. And they were in a little like coat closet in that guest room. And then uh, Leela was singing on an SM7 live right in the back of the control room. And so no headphones wow. for anyone in the control no headphones, room. So, yeah, right. Yeah. So she just we had it cranked and everyone's playing. And the problem was we'd get done with the take and everybody's in the room except Ollie, the drummer. And yeah. so we'd start talking and then we'd hear Ollie kind of go, uh, guys, guys. Um, so how was that? Like, oh, shit, we forgot to turn the talk back. Up. <laughs> I mean, and he's right there. He's only a few feet away. He could have just opened the door, but he's behind his kid. Right. And the live room was small, so he couldn't get out easily. So right. he'd just sit there and we'd keep forgetting. So we finally put a laptop with uh whatever the equivalent of facetime was at that point and so the delay was horrendous but at least we could see him so he could wave you know when we yeah. forgot to talk to him but it was great we cut the whole record relatively quickly i don't remember how long but i mean less than two weeks i think mm. and then probably a week of overdubs and then mixed it and yeah it, it turned out great that's the album bruiser yeah. um yeah, it's it's a really good record. It was really fun to make. That's that's amazing. I mean, there's, you know, we could dive down a whole rabbit hole of, uh, you know, tips and tricks that you did with small recording space to make that record sound great. You know, well, I'll tell you with the drums. I knew when I got to. I don't know if we've talked about the house I had in L.A. at all. A little bit. We a did little a little bit. bit. Yeah. And so the studio was partially built. So in the main big room, all, all I really did was put down carpet. Like the rest of it was fine. But there was kind of the garage. And then there was what was probably like a little covered shed thing, like a lean to roof. Mm -hmm. And they built the outside wall, but it was all one room. So I put a wall up in between the two rooms. But then the ceiling was angled. And then I had a machine room taking up about a third or a quarter of that back room, which was going to be the live room. And I put that wall at a crazy angle. Hmm. So there were the only parallel surface was the front and back wall. And then I put a rail and just put uh, packing blankets on one by two frames. And so I could hang them and move them around. So there were very few parallel surfaces and that made the room sound three or four times the size it was. And then for the overhead, so I could get them high enough above the kit because the ceiling wasn't high. And like by the time you'd walk to the low part, I couldn't stand up. It was probably six feet. Wow. So I just had foam on the ceiling and then the overhead. I'm sorry, you can't see that. So foam on the ceiling and then the overhead right there. So hmm. there are no reflections coming off the ceiling. So it didn't feel like there was a bunch of space up top, but they're cardioid anyway. So it didn't really yeah. matter. Um. 
and we recorded, I mean, a pretty, you know, standard set of mics, close mics on the drums, stereo overheads, um, usually a mono room, but every once in a while a stereo room, but it was really two mono rooms because it sounded so different when you got away mm -hmm. from the kit. Um, yeah. And that would, that's when I still had the console set up. So most of the drums are tracked through the BCM 10, uh, 1073s, yes. and then whatever other channels I needed to do, uh, we did on the board, but it meant that I could leave the console set up for mixing. So right. I had eight channels down at the end of the second console. So it was in and out. So those were right next to me. So I had the 10 on the BCM 10 and then another eight on that Neve. And then I had a few outboard pre's and I could use preamps on the board if I had to. Right. Um, yeah, so that's the best way to make a room sound bigger is to not have it be parallel because what sounds like the sound of the room is the standing waves. Mm -hmm. And the smaller the room, the higher the standing waves are. So instead of being down at, you know, 100 hertz, they're up in that 500 hertz range, which mm. we've talked about is evil. Right. And it's what sounds boxy. So yeah, I've got some great drum sounds. There's another record which i don't even know if it's on that list this band killing bees and we just listened to it yesterday because it's gonna come out but it was tracked at my place in less than a week and the drums sound huge wow. obviously it's a good drummer on a good kit i mean that is step one yeah get the right. kit tuned properly like i actually paid for drum text to come out on sessions where the drummer didn't tune their own drums and that is money well spent Mm, so right. but yeah so for that record that was it and it was really about just getting the feel of the band that was exactly what i felt was missing from the first version of a lot of those songs and we got it and you know we ended up replaying a lot of the guitars because they were just playing through a combo and they you know there were a lot of tones that needed to change we may have replayed some of the bass but probably we just reamped it because i had a di and we were monitoring a sans amp which sounded great so we just added my SVT to that afterwards. Um, and we actually ended up keeping some of the vocals from the live takes, like a lot of her ad libs. And that's how we know the take was good. We get to the end and she would be going nuts. And we, like, that's the take. We didn't even go back and listen some of the times. Yeah. Like that's it. Mm. And then later on, if there was a problem somewhere, I'd just do a quick edit from another take or whatever. But yeah, yeah I love tracking the whole band. I love tracking without headphones it's awesome yeah so that was a little side question here do you prefer tracking everybody in the control room or separated control room i actually really enjoy having people in the control room i haven't done very many recordings where the drummer's in the same room um mm -hmm. i think we talked about me having to track chad smith when he was like four feet away from me but that's a different <laughs> kettle of fish um so no i haven't done that much with the drummer in the same room and I think with a loud rock kit, that would be like, you wouldn't know what you've got. And right. if you look at pictures, like Lenoir was always having the console in the studio, but their baffles and things and the kit was the furthest away if it was someone playing loud. And I think that could be tough. If you know the room, then, you know, you don't need to hear it great. But um, like, we'll talk about it when we get to Weezer. Sometimes you're in a room that's so loud that basically I would wear headphones, but the band didn't need to, mm -hmm. which is great. Because I think for the band, we've talked about it before, the most important part of any studio is the headphone mixer. Mm -hmm. And even with really great sounding headphones, it's not the same for a band that spends most of their time rehearsing or playing live. Mm -hmm. You know, So yeah, I love tracking with the rest of the band in the control room. And I love doing vocals without headphones in the control room. You can't do it on every project, but it, it's right. really fun when you can. Yeah. So uh, with the Duke Spirit, how did you guys, like, how did she hear herself? Because you said no headphones? Or no, that one had to have headphones. The drummer was in another room. I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it had headphones, but a lot of them were on one ear because, well, I think Leila had headphones, but the other guys didn't because I had the speakers cranked so they mm. could hear everything. So I'm pretty sure no one wore headphones except Leila just so she could have some more of herself. Yeah, that sounds really fun uh okay so was there a song called fade away on that record there's a question in the chat here that i'm not sure if it's for q a or related to this record i don't remember yeah um, i'm terrible with song titles i really am i'm worse with names but i'm terrible with song titles 
Okay, I'll I'll look into that and maybe we'll come back to that for Q and A. Fade away might have been. Is that killing bees? I don't remember. Uh, anyway, I'll find out in a minute. And cool, we got questions coming in for Adele and all kinds of stuff. So this is looking good. Okay, next up on the list, I have mm. Lincoln Park. Lincoln Park. Wait, wait, wait. So uh, Lincoln Park. So we're moving on. <laughs> Is that... I think so. Yeah. Unless you yeah. have more on Duke Spirit. Oh, no. I thought that we were moving on from Lincoln Park because you played the air horn. Like, that's oh. it. Time's <laughs> that's up. the end of it. Right. That was yeah. the one word was the air horn. Yeah. So uh, Lincoln Park happened right after Stadium Arcadium. And it mm -hmm. was at Rick's Laurel Canyon house. Um, so we still had the Neve in the control room there. Um, yeah. I mean, they're just super talented. And they make records the way they make records so they had a bunch of stuff that they'd already done demos of and their demos are you know they're more than demos mm -hmm. um but there were a couple of songs where rick felt like i think not the same as the duke spirit but the kind of thing like oh these would be great live band songs and we, we said it wasn't with they didn't say why there was another band that i was working on some stuff and i said well why don't we just track this as a band and they said why so Lincoln Park <laughs> wasn't like that, but it was just not the way they work. So we set up and we tracked some stuff as a band and they're like, mm, that's not really what we do. It's not what we want to do. Like they really wanted control. So Rob would come in and they'd track drums for a while and they'd really get it. And then Rob would be involved in the editing and, you know, making sure it was exactly what they want. And um, yeah, they're just really talented. They know exactly what they want. And one of the cool things was, um for the guitars brad really wanted to experiment with guitar tones because i don't think he really had you know they they're not self-taught like they sat in bedrooms and made the records i mean they had producers and they were making records from record one but um they hadn't really branched out into that as much and so i rented a bunch of amps from joe barisi i just said what's cool and we got a ton of them brought up and then brad and i went through them all like the first day or first couple of days and we sent a few of them back but we had uh we had an old watkins that sounded amazing mm -hmm. like the bo diddley amp um i don't remember everything we had but it was a ton of stuff and what it was resource. great <laughs> yeah so we we had all of them mic'd and i had i think it took two or three guitar switchers to have them all going Right. um and we used the the little labs pcp which is a really uh versatile guitar switcher that's awesome and you can chain them so we had those going and a couple of, i think we had another switcher as well and that way we could just like okay what do we want to do right now yeah and then we do it and um yeah they they would just work on stuff too like there were times during that record where they just wanted the control room and I'd go sit like out at the dining room table because they were just in it. And it's not like they needed help on Pro Tools. You know, right. they knew what they were doing and there wasn't any recording going on right then. And they just felt like, well, it'll be easier if we just get on with this. And then I would like Brad would yell like, hey, we're going to do some guitar. And, you know, you'd have to sprint in there and get back into it. And you don't even know what song they're working on. Like, right. it's just time to do some guitar. So you kind of get going and do that. And they're like, OK, cool. And like, oh, OK, I'll just, you know, go hang out out here again. Right. And so it, but it was good. I mean, I think that um, and also I wanted to say Ethan Mates was a big part of that record because he had worked with them on a lot of the demos. And then he came in because that's the record I had to leave to go do the U2 sessions, which I believe mm -hmm. we already talked about. Yeah. and then came back and so he took over the engineering while i was gone and because he worked with them i think it was actually good because they really had a rapport um and you know in some ways it was no transition at all to have him come in and do that and then he hung out for the rest of the record and kind of took over as they got closer to the end and they moved out of laurel canyon and he took over doing overdubs and stuff mm -hmm. um yeah great engineer he's the one of the people whose name i couldn't remember on one of mm. these right which is right. not cool at all i think that we might have talked about this record specifically on part three well i probably just said all different stuff that contradicts whatever i said on part three 
It, actually, I think it was closer to verbatim. <laughs> because okay. I was like, well, I I'm all sorry. We just, yeah. uh, you know, we've well. stretched this over six months. I noticed today the first part of this was six months ago. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, we've, um, I'm repeating myself. I'm old. I'm allowed to repeat myself. Absolutely. Especially when you're uh, talking about stuff like this. I think everybody's okay with it. Okay. Uh, let's let's move on to our next record, which is going to be Blood Red Shoes. The name of the record, Say Something, Say Anything. This was around 2008 well, that, was that it was single. released. That was a single. Mm -hmm. So Box of Secrets is the album. Okay. Um, so Blood Red Shoes it's duo super talented everyone should go listen to that record and they're still making records um mm -hmm. tom dalgetty did their last record he's the guy who did all the royal blood stuff um so it's duo uh guitar and drums and laura plays guitar and sings and steven plays drums and sings and i've met very few people with more energy than steve he's fucking just on it all the time and laura's super cool guitar player mm -hmm. and singer and so again that was a management call like hey let's get andrew to mix this record and i wasn't really aware of them they'd only had a couple of singles out before i could be wrong about that they might have put out a record before but i don't think so mm -hmm. um and the important thing about this record is they're english and I was going to be coming over for the summer because we would bring the kids over to see their grandparents and stay basically five minutes from where I am right now, which is why we're in this area. And so I was looking for a place to mix it. And I didn't want to go into London because that's over a two hour train ride. And I would have ended up having to stay there. Mm. So I was just poking around looking for studios and I found Mono Valley. I'd never heard of it before. They had an SSL. I called up. We got a rate to mix it and like, okay, great. So I went down there and it's exactly an hour's drive door to door. So I'd go down in the morning, mix, and then come home just in time to go to the pub for a pint, which was always very important. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and mix that record pretty much a song a day. And then we did a couple of recalls um, towards the end. But it was my first time being in that studio. And of course, I didn't I think we might have done a couple of overdubs, you know, while we were mixing. But it also, it turned out that they had tracked the record there, which I had no idea. I just randomly found the studio. And then that turned into the relationship where when the SSL, which was already kind of not, it like it had issues the way any SSL that age would, like it had the plasma meters and those stopped working and getting the power supply mm. fixed for those things was insane. Um, we found one channel had bad recall and we only found out when we went to recall and it was the kick channel. <laughs> like, oh, okay. But I mean, you know, they were maintaining yeah. it, but at, at some point it just like, they were a tracking studio for the most part. And yeah. so that console went out and my Neve went in and that was the beginning of that. So, yeah. you know, that was the first time I was there, but that's a great record. I heard a couple of years ago, I heard, um, is it down by the sea? Something like that. One of the songs off that, which, I mean, you know, the album came out a long time ago, um, but I heard one of the songs on six music here and it sounded fucking great. Like, and not because I did it. I mean, it's because I think six music crushes things on the way out, but yeah, it was good. It was good. Right. And it was, you know, one of those song a day, not easy, but not, you know, it was fun. It was a really yeah. fun record to do. Awesome. Yeah, um, I think Paul Lucas has said it best here. Andrew does what he wants. There are no rules. <laughs> <laughs> I do what I want. Wow. Yeah, there you go. This little chat thing is great. I, I think that, <laughs> that Debbie would disagree with that. I do what she wants. <laughs> Take it up with Paul. Okay. Um, it sounds you all these sessions that you're talking about it sounds like you um you had a really great time but one thing that always stands out to me is it sounds like uh you really became friends with all of these people you know and yeah i mean i think that the any record you're in the band while you're making the record cuz mm -hmm. you're in the studio and you're spending as much time and sometimes more time in the studio than they are and you know sometimes it sticks and you keep in touch with them forever and sometimes it's like the day after the record that's it and you don't talk to mm -hmm. them again and 
but it's it's like you know friends at summer camp when you're a kid they're your yeah. best friend ever until you go home you're like nah, i'm never going to talk to that kid again right. so <laughs> but in not, not in a bad way it's weeks. just you know yeah. sometimes it, it doesn't last but yeah it's man if doing this because you know i know lots of people say well it's not work you're just having fun and whatever but it is a hell of a lot of work while you're in the middle of it and if it's not with good people it's just horrible right it's really yeah. horrible to spend that much time in a room working on stuff so yeah yeah mm. i love it when the people are good yeah cool the sessions at your house always sound the most fun <laughs> We're yeah. going to Debbie. <laughs> <laughs> Debbie, wait, hold on. I have something for you. There we go. Uh, and he does what he wants. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So <laughs> awesome. Um, okay, so let's move on to Cass McCombs, and the name of the Cass record is "Dropping the Writ." Is that the record yeah. or the? Single? Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's yeah. the record. Um. Again, I cannot remember how it came to be that I got to work on that record. Mm. Cass is a great artist, is a seriously great songwriter, um, and makes really interesting records. Like trying to figure out what it is he's hearing is, it's a journey, it really is. So that was one of the first records I worked on on the Neve that I bought mm. because the, Chili Peppers one was rented. And then when it left, I think I already said we got really sad. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, the, some of these things are, we're talking about out of order, but it doesn't really matter. Um, so I had the 32 input 8068 um, and the BCM 10, because that was part of the deal when I bought the, the console um, is that it, it was, I was gonna buy it, it was Scott Litt's console um, did a bunch of the REM and Liz Fair records yeah. and, you know, amazing producer. Um, and it, it was being sold through Ocean Way. And so I was like, okay, I'll do it. And this was going to be a line of credit taking all the equity out of our house and like, okay, we're going to make this work. And then after I'd made the decision to do it, like, oh, yeah, he's not going to sell it. I'm like, what? Okay. So I spent the next many months looking for another one. Just, I found one that was like crated up, but I, you don't know if that works and yeah. we couldn't test it and things. And then I got a call from, uh, I think it was from Ernie at Ocean Way saying, okay, he'll sell you the console, but uh, you have to buy the BCM 10 as well because he wants a certain amount of money. And I, um, I don't know how I'm going to afford that, but okay. Like we just right. figured it out. So that board went in, uh, no automation. I put the flying faders on later. And, uh, so yes, yeah, so the cast record was one of the first things on that console and it was cool because we worked on it sort of in two chunks as well. We had a few songs we had to mix that we did mix, and then he was going to go off and finish recording some stuff. And we talked about like, hey, well, if you're going to go record, like I hear this, that, and, and, you know, maybe two out of the 30 things I said actually ended up happening. But it, it was interesting to watch him sort of interact because I think like Shara with My Brightest Diamond, he's got the record in his head. But I think that, and I could be totally wrong, I'm making this up, Shara hears the record already like mm. the finished record and she's fine to be surprised along the way and all of that whereas i think cass kind of feels the record yeah he's written the songs he kind of knows what the setting for each song should be but so like there's one mm. song on there where we thought it was going to be a trombone solo or something like that i might be conflating two songs maybe one of them had a trombone solo i know a couple of them had trombone but there was one where there was a solo section and it didn't have a solo on there yet. And we were mixing it. I'm like, well, so what are we going to do with this? Like, but we're listening to it. Like, yeah, but the track's great. Like it needs something because otherwise that section is too long, but it's really cool. So what are we going to do? And he's like, I, I know what we're going to do. And he brought in a pack of cards. I think they were tarot cards so that they would be larger, not because they were tarot cards. 
and he stood in front of the mic and just flipped through the deck. Hmm. So you had this <laughs> as he's flipping through and it was perfect. It was this kind of random noisy thing that gave that entire section structure, but never took you away from listening to the track because it wasn't a solo. Wow. Yeah. So yeah, there's, so there's huh. a deck of cards solo on that record. No idea which song. And then there was another one where I was, I don't remember why it was like, this happens to me every once in a while where I'm mixing a song and there's just a lead vocal. And I'm like, well, hold on a second. This needs to be harmonized or there should be background vocals or what the hell's going on. And so I vocoded the acoustic guitar with his voice and made this choir out of the acoustic guitar. So it's like, well, I don't have to play keyboards because he's playing all the notes. And, you know, there's some things which if you change them, like that was not going to go well. But I, you know, vomited all over this song with the vocoder. And he's like, oh, that's great. Like, okay. And so I gave him the vocoder because like, well, how am I going to do this live? And I was using just this single space rack mount vocoder. And I still had the, the one in my modular. Well, I mm -hmm. used the modular, but I'm like, I had this other one. And so I just gave it to him. He was like, okay, cool. Thanks, man. And, you know, I don't know if he ever used it, but. Wow. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Man. Okay. So that sounds like a record that we all need to go listen to. So that was uh, Dropping, Dropping the, the writ. writ. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. I want to go find the deck of cards solo. <laughs> yeah yeah i yeah. couldn't tell you which song it's on it's one of the longer ones but yeah it's the whole album's great he's yeah. really really good amazing um yeah yeah I, I don't think i'm messing this up but there's a uh a video with jakir um doing like a a start to finish kind of recording with with him oh right um for i think it's a ua promo thing or something but yeah it was really fun to watch um yeah seems like a great artist cool okay you have a whole bunch of really fun questions coming in for later by the way i'm just right, storing good. them up here uh one of the things that's not on the list is faves which maybe mm. i should talk about now because it ties in with the mono valley thing yeah do you remember so, the name of the record uh 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 no <laughs> i'll go look yeah <laughs> Because it's the one with the lighthouse on the cover. It's kind of a brown and yellow cover with the lighthouse. Cool. I should remember it. But the thing is, albums get named after I'm done working on them. Right. You know? Yeah. So sometimes I'm surprised. Like, oh, okay. And song titles, too. Mm -hmm. You know? They just change um, last second. Yeah. So I th we must have mentioned already this band Motorcycle, which actually, that's not on the list, and we have to talk about them for a while. Awesome. Um, yeah. But massive fan of this band because I worked with a Norwegian band who like put some of their stuff on my iPod back when you had iPods. Right. And just loved them and listened to everything. I bought all the records and stuff. And this is long before I ever met them. But um, I decided like I wasn't going to be able to make a motorcycle record, but I thought, well, hold on. They've got this really active community like on message boards back in the days of message boards. So I started scouring message boards to see what other bands, the people who like Motorcycle, listen to. And so there were a couple, there was one uh, called Deus, uh, who were from uh, Belgium. And then there's this band Faves, who are from Switzerland, from Luzon. And so I just got in touch with them and said, hi, I'm Andrew Sheps, and I really like your music. I listened to some of their records, really like your music, and I'd love to work with you. So um, I scheduled a trip, and this is we're still living in LA, and I actually came over and met the bands. Like, it's mm. the only time I've ever done that. Got on a plane, and this also, I realized that my passport had expired. <laughs> so I had to like get the emergency three day passport thing. I've been there which was great. <laughs> yeah. um, and it was the middle of January and it was really fucking cold, especially in Switzerland. So I went, I met Deus um, and just because of logistics, that one didn't work out, but I managed to get a really good friend of mine, Adam Noble, um, ended up working with them and did a lot of stuff with them, which was great. But I went to, fa to see Faves in Luzon and we had fondue, which was awesome. 
as you do in mm -hmm. Switzerland. And so I went to a couple of rehearsals and here's a thing, and it's not just Switzerland, but it, it's a lot of Europe where any building built during the Cold War that was more than a certain number of stories had to have a bunker underground. So since the Cold War ended, though it's about to start again, seems like, um, every single one of those bunkers had a band in it. Mm. Because what the hell else are we going to do in it? But they're completely soundproofed. They have some ventilation, not enough, as it turns out. <laughs> not for a band. But so, <laughs> so these bands are in there. So they were they had their setup for rehearsals in there. Went to rehearsals, did sort of pre production on the fly with them. Like, okay, great, we're going to make a record. And we were trying to figure out exactly how to do it. And I said, well, why don't we go to Mono Valley? Mm. You know, it's got this great looking live room which I hadn't used, but I loved the control room. I loved being out there. The people were great. It's fully residential. So you eat three meals a day there and mm -hmm. it's awesome. So we had 12 songs to do and we booked 12 days. Like, okay, that's what yeah. we're going to do. And we decided beforehand, and I'd wanted to do this before and it just never quite worked. We were going to do one song a day, start to finish, done. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to move on. And we did. So every day, and I'd heard all the songs, but every day, right after breakfast, we'd go out there, they'd play the song a couple of times, pre-production, pre-production, sometimes up until lunch, sometimes take two was it. Then we'd immediately go into overdubs. And then after lunch, from lunch to dinner, we'd keep doing that and we'd do some lead vocals. Then after dinner, depending on how much dairy there was. We do more lead vocals, we do some background vocals, and we do percussion, lap steel, like whatever we were gonna do that would finish off the track. And then other than background vocals, they were done, completely mm. finished. And then the next day we'd go on to the next song. And so on that record, um, which I don't know the names of the songs, so this won't be any good. Uh, hold on. I'm going to look up the names of the songs. Have we figured out which album it is? Yes, it is called Bigger Mountains, Higher Flags. No, nope. If it's the one around 2007. No, it's called On Guard. It has the lighthouse on the front. Well, it's not a lighthouse. Ah, it it okay. looks like the Chrysler building with a bunch of stuff coming out. Um, all right, hold on. Hold oh, yeah. on, okay? Holding. Just hold on. I'm looking this up because it's just, driving me nuts. Just hold on. Yeah, just hold your horses. <laughs> what the hell? Oh yeah, Let's the Chrysler do... Building looking one. Got it. Yeah, Here, I'll uh, I'll put that link in the chat for everybody. Yeah, okay, it's because this is this is kind of a good story in a way, though. You know, by the time I find this stuff, everyone's gonna be like asleep. Mm. Uh, okay, songs. So it is. I think it's Under the Sun. So Under the Sun, they came out to play the song in the morning. And it was like a fast punk thing. Mm -hmm. But it was a mess. It was an absolute mess. Like the kick had nothing to do with the bass, had nothing to do with the guitars. And also, just by the way, it's a six-piece band that we're tracking. So it's drums, bass, two guitars, two keyboards. Okay. All live. And we all, we would do little fixes, but everything we recorded was used. So, so they're playing the song Under the Sun, and I'm like, look, okay, the only way we're going to clean this up is Chris, who's the lead singer and the guy who had written this song, just bring your guitar into the control room, an acoustic guitar. Everybody's going to sit down on the couch, and you're going to play the song slowly for them so they can hear the strumming pattern and like what the song actually is. So he started playing it slowly on the acoustic guitar and he's singing and it's like, hold on a second. This is like the most beautiful song on the record. The lyrics were heart wrenching, like everything about it was amazing. So I said, well, this is how we're going to do this song. It, we're not doing the other thing. Yeah. So we did that version and it took all day to get it but when we got it the entire lead vocal is the live take and i tuned the very last word and that was it 
Um, and I don't know overdub wise what we did on that. I'd love to say that we didn't do any, but we probably did. We probably did some overdubs on it. But then at the end of the day, the drummer was like, he was such a metal guy. Um, I mean, if I'm not going to remember which, which, uh, band it is. Oh, God damn it. It's, it's, you know, one of the metal bands has been around forever, tons of records. And at some, at one point we're sitting around at night and like, Hey, so, all right, 10 favorite records. And the drummers were the 10 records that that band had put out up to that point. Like, that's it. There were no other records in the world. So he was pissed at having to play slow all day. So he's like, but now we have to track the other one. And we did it. And it was awesome. And we did one take. And that was it. Wow. Yeah. And so that song is, uh, I can't remember the name of it, but it's on the record. And if you listen to it, the changes are exactly the same, but there's a different melody and they put this big kind of synth hook on it. Oh, wow. But both oh, versions cool. of that song are on the record, but you would never recognize the the rock one oh. as being the same as Under the Sun. It's just you have the same key, same progression. Yeah. 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 Wow. Cool. How do you remember all of these details from session? I I couldn't do that. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, some of it like is I because... Like I the last word. How do you remember that? <laughs> it It's a big deal, you know? Like that stuff is... Yeah. when stuff like that happens in a session and you can not take credit but you're it's like you can be proud of your own contribution instead of just being proud of the record you made for other people you remember it at least i do mm. yeah because that's huge all the rest of the time like i can think i did a good job but i'm doing a good job on someone else's stuff and there's no like ooh, i made that happen right you know but like the low roar records and that and some other stuff when you're really involved i guess i just don't forget yeah yeah cool All it right. looks like debbie's leaving I'm just everyone say goodbye to debbie no. the cats are bothering you well, they won't leave me alone. <laughs> the cats won't <laughs> leave her alone it's because she's the one who always gives them treats yeah and and then Mole really likes to sit on her, but he's got claws that are out and she doesn't want any part of it. So she's yeah. off. Sorry. The cats are the ones that make the rules. Yeah, That's the really cats are the ones who yes. make the rules. Well, you can't yeah. make rules for cats, therefore. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, let's, uh, let's move on to our next one, shall we? Where were we? So we were talking Cass McCombs and then we yeah. went on to Favez. Um so the next on our list is the international noise conspiracy international and noise conspiracy name of the record is the cross of my calling yeah i've worked on two records for them i think yes i did um so great band uh the front man is uh dennis Lixon from refused who mm -hmm. is oh guys someone says bye <laughs> um He's just a ridiculous front man. If you've never heard Refuse, you need to go listen to Refuse. Like The, the yeah, Shape of definitely. Come to Come is one of the best records ever made. Yeah. And International Noise Conspiracy was his like protest band instead of being like the punk metal protest band. This was more um I don't know, it, it just rock. They were just a rock band. And so like with so many records with Rick, I can't sort of came in at the end to finish up tracking because someone else had tracked the record. I don't remember if it was Greg Fiddleman or Dave Schiffman. I'm pretty sure it was one of those two, but I, I might have that wrong. Mm -hmm. um, so I came in and did all the lead vocals with Dennis and then uh, background vocals and some percussion and, and stuff like that. And then uh, and then mixed the record. And but and they were great. And Dennis is awesome. And he's the one I dealt with most because we were doing the vocals. Mm -hmm. And during that record, while we were doing vocals, um, I don't know why I could go to this. Maybe we just got tickets like the way normal people would. But they were doing an advanced screening of The Two Towers, the second Peter Jackson Lord of the Rings movie. Mm -hmm. And I'm a ridiculously large Lord of the Rings nut. And they were doing one and Howard Shore was going to talk afterwards. 
and it was early it was at like 8 30 in the morning because it was at the cinerama dome and they had to clear you out before they had their first movie at 11 or whatever it was and so i got tickets and dennis was going to come with me like all right which is great yeah. so i picked dennis up and we get there and we think like well it you know it's at whatever time it is so we'll get there half an hour before we find we were last in the line actually it must have been where it was free but you just had to show up or something like that because we were the last people to get in mm. and we ended up in the front row but fortunately in the center but we spent the entire movie like yes. this <laughs> and then Breaking howard Shore was sitting like two feet in front of us when he came to to talk but that was awesome. And another oh, man. Dennis story. Well, no, we'll wait. We'll wait till we talk about that other record because it's not really a, it is a Dennis story, but it's to do with another band. Um, yeah. So they were great. They were, yeah. you know, really fun. Great band. Um, both records I worked on with them. I really loved. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Um, I, I just had another moment of deja vu. So we might be repeating ourselves again because i was like oh uh, so i already Lamadon. did the hives no, yeah and it's yeah the town story yeah yeah see this is the well, problem the cinerama I... dome yeah we did that did we <laughs> yeah wow because i knew that story unless you've told it to me some other time but i don't know how that yeah come i up. probably did i really <laughs> apologize for this <laughs> it's like i remember all this stuff but i don't remember what we talked about already. right yeah that's, I mean, it's a great story and not everybody's going to watch every second of every part of this. So I think it's just... Though like, they should. <laughs> though they should. Okay. Um, so in the spirit of moving through things somewhat fast so we don't go to part 20, uh, let's chat about Neil Diamond, Home Before Dark. The year is 2008. <laughs> Where were you? Uh, Neil has a studio... I mean, I don't know if he still has it, but uh, a studio in, it's not really West Hollywood. It's kind of south of West Hollywood or something like that, getting towards Beverly Hills and whatever. Um, I can't remember. It was a label studio, um, but not Motown or anything like that. But it's a really great studio. A lot of jazz stuff was cut there. Um, and so that was tracked as a band. And I'm because I worked on two records with him, 13 songs and that record, that record, I don't believe I did the bulk of the recording. I'm pretty sure Greg Fiddleman did, but I came in and recorded a lot of it and then uh, mixed. And then the the second record, 13 songs, I did almost all the recording as well. The thing about those records were that um no drummer on any of it and neil was going to play guitar mm. which he didn't usually do i mean he wrote everything on guitar but he never played and mm. this is something rick did it's something don was has done it's something i've done like the person who writes the song and is the singer and that's why i had chris come in on that faves track that's the song that's mm -hmm. the feel it's the dynamics it's everything unless they're a terrible guitar player which they aren't so having them actually play on the song even if it's just tucked in or if it's just for other people to listen to is really important instead of letting everybody else impose their will you know um yeah. and the bands on those two records were slightly different but just amazing i mean i'll, I'll let you guys look up the bands they're just incredible so that was another one where neil would play in the song they would start to work stuff out sometimes it would go really quickly sometimes we'd revisit a song but the thing i remember especially on 13 songs was that neil is constantly writing lyrics and working on him and working on him and working on him mm. but when you want to punch in a line he has to be playing guitar because he was playing guitar otherwise right. everything sounds totally different for the punch yeah and it's a different day it's like it's playing a different dynamic it's six this much later yeah. he's by himself <laughs> it's all had like it was really tricky but it was the kind of thing where i would punch in and it would be totally different but he'd hear it and i'd hear it and by the second maybe the third take it was matching and it was fine 
because we'd both like hear what the hell was going on and adjust and it was good and so i would have these stacks of tracks where it would be the vocal the acoustic guitar and i think there was a room mic that i would take as well and so every time we would record a fix for something i couldn't just put it on the track so i had these sets of three tracks and sometimes there would be 10 sets of them because he'd keep going back and doing stuff. So every day we worked on the song, it would be on its own set of tracks. And I'd just be making playlists and muting things on other tracks. But sometimes he'd redo one thing, which would get rid of another thing. But if you didn't use that, you had to unmute on that. So like the the paper trail to figure out what was going to go on when he said, well, hold on, let me hear the comp from like four versions ago. And, you know, I had a notebook that was nothing but that. So wow. we could go back and hear each version yeah. of the vocal comp. Yeah. Did you, on? Um, I was thinking this when you were talking about some of the first sessions at Mono Valley too. Did you usually have assistants that were working with you on these? Yeah. 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 Mono Valley always had a staff. Um, so mm -hmm. they would have a staff engineer who could engineer for you, but would be your assistant otherwise. And then they always had an intern who was from, uh, was it from Swansea? They had a, a relationship set up with one of the colleges that had a recording program. And oh, so nice. people would take yeah. a semester mm -hmm. and work at the studio, yeah. uh, which was great. They were yeah. basically slave labor and they lived up in the attic. But for us, it was great. And mm -hmm. some amazing engineers have come out of there. I mean, mm -hmm. I still work with some of them. Um, I'm doing a, um, a uh, an Abbey Road Academy thing later in the year and I'm recording one of them it's his band mm. and so cool. like they're all out in the world and working which is yeah. amazing really really great uh thing and then at Neil's studio yeah they're always an assistant uh and they had a guy I'll never remember his name but someone who would work for Neil forever who knew the studio inside and out mm. but uh that's the first time I met Dana Nielsen it was the first hmm. time that he had done anything for Rick. And so he was assisting on that session. Cool. And then he, I mean, I think he's still doing stuff for Rick on and off. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, fantastically talented engineer and producer and sax player and songwriter. And he's a bastard. I hate him because he's nice. too talented. Yeah. Um, did you, so the reason I asked that question, sorry, these things keep cutting out on me. Um, the reason I asked that question, you were talking about the taking the notes, you know, in filling up your notebook and everything. Is that stuff that you would ever rely on an assistant for? Not that stuff, because it, yeah, I would need to do that because only I would be able to decipher it. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm sure Dana helped out with some of that. Yeah. Uh, well, what he helped out with is the, the vocal chain was the usual 1073, 1176 and straight in. Um, but so he would be documenting mm -hmm. what each take was recorded with the tech side. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's where we would always start for the next time we did a punch in and it would never work. And, right. but it would be, you know, we'd always start from there. Cause the last mm -hmm. thing we wanted to do the, the dynamic range of that album was huge. So mm -hmm. sometimes you're two clicks up on the mic pre you're 10 DB hotter. And like the last thing you wanted was to have the first take take his head off in the headphones or him not be able to hear it. And so we always wanted to start from a place where he would get comfortable. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Very cool. Uh, yeah. But notes on takes of stuff, I would always do that. Yeah. Always. And I've, I've seen it kind of both ways. Um, uh, Jakir again, he had some uh, insane assistance uh, on his start to finish. For example, those guys were back there just nonstop filling up notebook after notebook after notebook and, yeah, always. There's so much for you to to manage while you're actually doing the record. It's always curious to me. Like everybody's got a different style of how much they like their assistant involved in that side of the process versus the technical. And I yeah. always, I mean, I love to have other people do stuff, but the problem is, if there's a problem, you're mm. fucked. Yeah, right. You know, and it wouldn't be because it's their fault. It's because they mm. they're not inside your head. They don't know what it is that you feel is important. Because, right. like, if you look at the the pad that I was filling out during the start to finish we did with Geese, yeah, it's numbers and then a number of stars and then maybe, like, two words. Right. But I comped it together without having to listen to anything because I knew exactly what we were going to use. Right. 
Right. And then 10 minutes later, there's no way in hell I'd remember any of that. But that's the way my brain works. And so yeah. it's the same with things like, you know, the comps and stuff like that. I just feel like if I don't do it, I'm not going to be able to decipher other people's notes because the notes are just reminders. They're yeah. not the notes. Yeah. Right. Right. The notes are in your head. You just need. Yeah, the I mean, and when notebook. Rick's doing stuff, he'll just say things, and you have to write it down. Like you're taking mm. the notes of what he said, plus you're taking all the notes that you're taking. Right. He's not writing it down. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and in that situation, I suppose it is a thing where if you're responsible for that final result of the vocal comp, it's not something you totally want to leave to chance by just shouting out, you know, comments to a assistant. No, I mean, and a lot of that went into the comments on the tracks and yeah, and stuff like that, but. Yeah, it got pretty convoluted. And, you know, sometimes I wouldn't have it all documented as well as it should be, but sometimes that would just be impossible. Yeah. You know. Absolutely. Okay. Um, I want to pause for a second to acknowledge the chat room. So, uh, one, uh, we need to get you some stickers made with a quote that everybody loves from you. <laughs> Awesome. That is the answer to every single question. So I could do this. I can't remember the guy's name, the basketball player who hated doing press and they made mm. him do an interview. And all he said was both teams played hard, my man. Both teams <laughs> played hard, my man, to every single question. Right. That, that's, that's the answer, answer to every question about audio. What's your favorite EQ on a kick drum? <laughs> all that matters is what comes out of the speakers. I love it. That's great. Uh, I've been torturing Andrew every time I see him. That's just the first thing I say to him. So, yeah. Uh, okay. So the chat room has some some cool questions coming in here. So uh, somebody asked if we're going to be taking questions at the end for Q and A, or if we're going to address the questions that are being asked in the chat room. Both. So yes, yeah, yes. both. Yes. Um, however, why don't we take a brief moment for this one? Okay. All that matters is what comes out of the speakers. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> um. Yeah. The gossip. That was. I never met him. Greg Fiddleman tracked that record um, and it's, well, I, I mixed a live record of theirs and then um, I ended up mixing the studio record, but Greg Fiddleman tracked that and I mean, he did an amazing job. It sounded incredible and he had done roughs on the API where it was tracked mm -hmm. and I actually ended up having to go back and finish the record there because mm -hmm. it just it was never going to sound like that because i mean you know old consoles you can say oh apis sound like this well okay maybe every api console sounds completely different mm -hmm. within the api realm of stuff and um he you know, he was driving the console for some stuff and so yeah that that record ended up being done back on that console and me figuring out where stuff was for the rough because they weren't roughs they was just sounded ridiculously good and then going from there and just sorting out like the few things that needed to be sorted out mm. awesome okay but uh then, much later on much later on after i'd moved to england uh i got a call from uh this amazing producer songwriter jen dis dis uh de silvio it's not de silvio de Sil Disilivo, I'm getting it. I feel like an asshole. I'm getting it wrong. Anyway, um, and she got in touch with me to mix uh, a Beth Ditto solo record, her solo record. And I started it. And there was one mix in particular, I can't remember the name of it, where I was like, holy shit, I've nailed this. Like, oh, my God, this is when the when the track kicks in, it like exploded in the best possible way. And that wasn't at all what they wanted. And I ended up not doing the record. Uh. <laughs> you know, <it's>, exactly. <laughs> so, I mean, it's it's personal taste, but it's one of the few mixes that I can still put on and just be like, fucking hell, that is awesome. Um, yeah. But yeah, yeah. It, it wasn't the record they were making. They wanted a bit more lo-fi and, you know, a bit cooler. Whereas I had done basically you could have put this in a club and people would have lost their minds. Nice. But that was the mix. Uh, yeah. yeah. Somewhere I'm yeah, sure, yeah. but that's not the record they were making. So no yeah. one's going to hear it but me. Right. Right. 
That's a bummer. Or yeah. if you come to a seminar, you might hear there you it. Go. Yeah. If I remember to bring it. Um, yeah. So anyway, so that's all. That's the gossip stuff. Awesome. Okay. Uh, next up is from DeLuca. So, Andrew, could you talk a little bit about how it was like working with Bruce Swedeen? I'm sure we talked about that with um, mm -hmm. on the Michael Jackson stuff. So that would have been episode one. So if you mm -hmm. haven't checked out episode one, it's got to be on there. Yeah. Um, but he's he was amazing. He was like Al Schmidt. It was his balances were insane. Absolutely insane. Mm. And I think a lot of people think of them as sort of doing one particular thing. But like with Bruce, he's known for the Michael Jackson thing, like the super clean pop funk mm -hmm. stuff. Um, but he started off recording the Chicago Symphony when he was in Chicago and doing jingles and all kinds of stuff. Al Schmidt Greg Wells played it on, we did the tribute to Al Schmidt version of um, Andrew Talks Dawson People mm -hmm. after he died. And Greg Wells came on and he played this thing where Al was recording drums for him on something. And it was a rock track. And just like with the big band thing I talked about, it was like, what the hell is going on? And then it was like the best rock drum track he'd ever heard. <laughs> And you got to think of the Toto records that Al did. And so Bruce was the same. He's just a fantastic engineer, period. Mm -hmm. Like that's all there is to it. Yeah. And he loved to blast me with the mains whenever I walked in front of the console and all kinds of stuff. And I can still hear him in my head, going, Andrew. <laughs> and, you know, I'd always be in trouble for something. <laughs> yeah, he was great. We had We had a really good time yeah awesome okay uh there's more of those but we'll save them for later let's get back to our regularly scheduled interview. and thanks for not asking what's my favorite compressor questions i i asked I'm about sure the there EQ. are like 20 of them but <laughs> yeah. all, all eq all right that's fine it's coming uh yeah let's see so i'll just keep on putting up the all that matters is what comes out of the speaker's quote for those exactly uh, i'll go to bed and you can <laughs> and I'll just hop back on the screen. put the question up and then put the other thing up because I'm All a right. dick. You can just put your puppet in the chair and yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Awesome. Okay, um, let's move on to Weezer, and I believe the first Weezer you worked on a couple Weezer records, right? There's more than one. Mm, no, just the one. So 2008, I... self-titled. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, they're all self-titled uh, until recently. But this was, I believe it was the Red Album. Mm -hmm. And so this was, uh, it was a Rick production. And we started off at Shangri-La, which is that where that API was for the gossip. Um, mm -hmm. And we tracked a bunch of stuff there. And it went well. It was cool. You know, um, I don't remember any sort of anything like in particular about that. But we had a lot of fun. The band's great. You know, Rivers is just another one with just a vision. And I, I, it's always great to kind of be able to understand what people are hearing, like we talked about with Cass, which was difficult. Um, and with Rivers, he loves pop songs, like mm. pop songs that are well written yeah. and then just plays them unbelievably loud. Like that's <laughs> the sweater song. You yeah. Know? That's what it is. So obviously by the Red Album, the songwriting is less, you know, just chunky and it there's more stuff going on. Like um, on that record, The Greatest Man That Ever Lived, it's insane. It It's orchestrated, basically. Mm -hmm. But the fun thing about that record is that we didn't finish at Shangri-La and then there was some other session coming in, so we couldn't continue working there. And so we were looking for somewhere else to record. And I can't remember if we went anywhere in particular, but then we found the Malibu Civic Center, which wow. right at the end of Topanga Canyon, uh, you make a left and you go down this road and it's the Civic Center and it's like a little concert hall. And there was a studio in there, but they put it upstairs. So it wasn't even the projection booth. So there was just a video link to the stage. 
And we got up there, we set them up. So they were set up kind of on stage, which was great. I mean, they had headphones and things, but mm -hmm. uh, they're all looking at each other. The whole band is down there. And I was up in this fucking room and I couldn't see them. I couldn't talk to them because sometimes they wouldn't be wearing headphones. And so I'd have to like walk around three things to get to the projection booth so I could lean out a window and talk to them. And after, I think it was after the first day, I just said, look, the space is amazing that we can work here and the control room sucks and I cannot work up there. Like it's not going to happen. And Rick wasn't with us at this point. We were just working. Mm -hmm. um, and so I said, look, they have a Midas board for front of house. Those things sound great. They're really good desks. There's nothing in them. The EQ is good. I will go down and track this record on that. We'll rent in a BCM 10 and a little API. We're going to take out two rows of seats. And this way I can get those preamps near me and we'll do the record that way. Wow. And so I think we spent a day setting that up. And then that's the way we did the rest of the record. And it was fucking awesome. Wow. I think we yeah. put up gobos like in the seats in front of where I was, but I basically had headphones on while we were tracking and then we had a pair of speakers up. And after a take, they would just come and wander out into the seats and put their feet up and have a listen and and then go back on stage How and do cool. stuff. And yeah. Every time we're going to record something, they're like, okay, well, we'll do this on the edge of the stage. And I'd put a microphone in the third row or, you know, just whatever we wanted to do. But we had this gigantic space. So it was all easy. We could get to everything. Yeah. But then a couple of times they had concerts booked. So we had to completely load out, bolt the seats back into the floor. They do the <laughs> concert, come back the next morning, take the seats back out, set everything back up, and then just go on as if yeah. nothing had happened. Wow. Wow. That sounds insanely fun. It was great. It really, really was. And I had to go, um, I don't remember exactly, it might have been a mix with the master's seminar or something like that, where I had to go out of town and Dave Schiffman took over. And it was one of the, you know, sometimes, um, you know, sometimes you don't want to leave because professionally, like, oh, I really want to stick with this thing or whatever. But I just missed how much fun it was every day. Just like, it almost felt like we were fucking around, but we were being so serious about it at the same time. Yeah. And it was so different that it was like, this is something I will not get to do again. You right. know? Right. And I hated missing it. Yeah. Yeah. Plus, yeah, I mean, for for the mortals, um, it's Weezer. <laughs> yeah. You <know>? Exactly. <laughs> That's hard to walk away from. And yeah. Also, it's Weezer, and you tracked in a venue. That's that's also in its own right amazing, right? Yeah, because you would think I mean, like, but you know, it's a Civic Center venue, and we put the bass amp at the back in the nursing room, because <laughs> if you had a baby at a concert and you had to go nurse, you'd go back in the bunker. And the first day we were tracking, basically the entire city of Malibu was complaining about the bass. Right. And so they dropped like, I don't know, 12 tons of sand into the wall. Wow. And then that worked. So no one could hear yeah. the bass amp anymore. Right. I, wow. Yeah. It was nuts. It, it was really kind of nuts. Yeah. Yeah. Also, don't take your kids to concerts. Don't take babies to concerts. <laughs> well, if they got a nursing bunker, it's fine. Yeah. They're good. Yeah. And they had speakers in there. So you would still hear the show while you were in there. Yeah, so you're good to go. Oh, nice. They would pipe a little a feed from front of house or something. And yeah, yeah, yeah that's exactly. great. You don't have to miss anything. There you go. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Um, man, the questions from the chat room today are amazing. I already have 39 questions saved. 39. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, we're not, we're, there's going to be at least one more of these. <laughs> yeah. Because I was supposed to go up at like 5 30 this morning. And yeah, I, yeah. We'll see how long my brain goes. I mean, this is, yeah, the chat room's on fire today. This is great. Um, Paul says, great story. Uh, okay. <laughs> nice. Uh, yeah, I just, the, I feel like there's more to talk about with that, just about how, um, I mean, you guys, you couldn't find another room to go to with Weezer, or you guys thought that that would be a really fun thing to do and wanted yeah, to Yeah, I mean, we could have, but I think they didn't want to go to, 
a regular studio. I, yeah. I don't remember exactly why. I mean, I think like this sort of came up while mm -hmm. we were thinking about where we were going to go. Mm -hmm. And it just seemed like a good idea. And well, okay, to be fair, we went because they had built that control room there and mm -hmm. they heard about it and like, oh, it's studio. And I think they were living or some of them were living out that way. And there really weren't any other studios out there. Mm -hmm. So it was, mm -hmm. it seemed like an obvious choice, but I, you know, no knock on the people who put that control room together, but it fucking sucked. It just, it, all due respect. Not that it sounded bad or whatever, <laughs> but I just working up there was the least amount of fun I'd had on a session like ever when it wasn't about the people. Mm, right. You know, you want to feel like you're in it. And instead, it was like you were in a remote truck with no talk back or some Ouch. shit. Yeah. But yeah. yeah, once we moved downstairs, that was like the best thing ever. Right. Yeah. That's so fun. Okay. Um, yeah, I wonder, I, I want to see pictures from that session. You know, that sounds like one of those things that you really want to I don't know about. if there are any. I yeah. mean, there must be some, but you know, I mean, this is mm -hmm. pre, well, I don't know if it's pre cell phone camera. It isn't, but it's, it's right around iPhone ish times. You're so yeah. used to everybody just taking pictures now, but yeah. 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 There Crazy. must be some. I actually, I have a feeling someone came in and took a bunch of pictures, but I don't remember. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, how long was that record? That you were on it anyway i i'm making this up but i think we spent about four to six weeks at shangri-la and then on and off because there were a couple of times we had to take breaks because they had too many concerts in or something like that but it had to be at least two or three months at the civic center because they just kept writing and we kept doing stuff and then i was gone for three weeks or something like that and then came back yeah um and they had recorded another couple of songs i'd never heard and so yeah. that's really yeah fun. it was it was a while yeah yeah you have a couple of these like these uh random let's build a studio in this thing and just do the record and they're always amazing records on top of it it doesn't sound like you know oh, i slept some gear down to the cabin and tried to make a record you know yeah i mean really... and there's i feel like that's a thing like it, mm -hmm. people worry too much about well, it's not that they worry too much. They kind of cut themselves slack by saying, well, I'm not in a proper studio. Who cares? Mm -hmm. right. I mean, it's not like that was a great sounding concert hall. And right. when I was working at Shangri-La, I mean, they've done work on the live room since then. It wasn't a fantastic sounding live room. Mm -hmm. And the control room was weird. And lots of studios I've been in are not yeah. great sounding. So obviously having some gear that's good. I mean, being able to rent in a BCM 10 and a couple of API mm -hmm. mic pre's, I mean, that's good. That yeah. helps a lot. Sure. But you don't need that. If yeah. you can just get the instruments to sound good and the band's good, good and you know. Mm -hmm. Just make the music. Yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> Somebody I mean, says... Sonari when recorded in a tent, you know? Anyway. Yeah. Right, right. That's great. All that matters is what comes out of the speakers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, important interjection here. Paul says if you're ever in North Yorkshire, he'll buy you a pint. That's very nice, Paul, but it'll have to be a pint <laughs> of like your best tap water or something because I don't <laughs> drink anymore, which is, I know that I used to end the interviews by getting a pint, but I don't yeah. drink. Yeah. So. We'll find very you a kind of something. Yeah. My daughter at some point commented, like, you realize you're straight edge, right? <laughs> uh, fuck. <laughs> I am. I yeah. no caffeine yeah. anymore. I can't deal with it. I don't drink. I don't smoke. I don't take any drugs. Yeah. How yeah. boring am I? Cleanest man in rock. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. I think straight edge has got some philosophical stuff that goes with it that I'm yeah. not. Yeah. I don't think I in there but you're like i'm just not doing that stuff so yeah <laughs> yeah cool uh i believe that this brings us up to um should i do it yeah i'm gonna do it death magnetic <laughs> <laughs> metallic what do you want to know what do you um, want to know 
chat room let's let's tag team this what do you guys want to know about death magnetic this will be fun they're on a delay so we'll just get started by how did you get called for the project uh another rick record uh, another one that uh greg fiddleman tracked uh they did it at sound city which mm. is cool you know in the big room at sound city uh where the first rage record was done and you know a million other rock records but I don't think they were really into the idea at first because I mean, you know, it, it was amazing, but it was a bit ratty. I, mm -hmm. If you've never seen pictures of the control room in there, it had shag carpet, brown shag carpet on the walls that had been there for a really long time. Mm -hmm. I, it's not good, but it's also one of the best sounding rooms ever in the history of studios. And it shouldn't have been, um, yeah. but so Greg tracked it. Uh, there were a lot of drum mics. I don't remember exactly how many, but I believe it was 30 or something like that. Wow. Like even the overheads were left, center, right, because there's no yeah. way you could do overheads with two mics. And the there were so, mics on every cymbal. Yeah, yeah. Um, top and bottom toms, I think. Mm. Uh, yeah, and Greg did an amazing job recording that record. Just yeah. great. Wow. Um, and so then when it was time to mix, it was just, it was obvious it was going to take forever for one person to mix it. So Greg was mixing and I was mixing at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, and so he was mixing at Sound Factory on uh, the API in Studio B, which is the Chad Blake room. Mm. Uh, and I was at home on my big fucking Neve. And that's when yeah. I bought the second half of the Neve because there's no way I could mix that thing on 32 inputs. Like, yeah. I mean, I was going to combine some of the drum mics and stuff, but still, it was never going to happen. So that's when I got in touch with Oceanway because the console I had rented for the Chili Peppers was a 40 input 8088 for the main part of the console. And then it was a 32 channel expander, no center section. And so I called up Oceanway and they had put the 8088 in a studio on St. Bart's, like in this ridiculous hotel where it would cost you like 10 grand a night, but it came with a Neve. Mm. Like, okay. Uh, so they had this expander laying around and I knew that there's nothing you can do with it. It has no center section. So it had patch bays like you could get in and out of it but it wasn't a console it was almost like it had just been racked up so i called him up and i said look you can't use this anymore i'd like to rent it but i'd really like to buy it mm. and this was another one where we'd worked it out we had a price we were all set and then i got a call yeah we're not going to sell that thing <laughs> and i said yes you are you said you would you're going to sell it. And then uh, through a chain of events, um, I ended up being able to buy it again, all the equity taken out of the house. I'd finally paid for the first one and then uh, put that in, extended the flying faders to it. Like it was a huge job to get done in the grounding between the two consoles and tying the mix mm -hmm. buses together. And Mike Wamscans, who was a tech at Ocean Way at the time, who then went to Henson and now's retired, was amazing. He we blasted through that console and got it set up. So anyway, that was the first record mixed at my place with both consoles. Yeah. Which was a luxury. I yeah. mean, you know, a 64 wow. input Neve is pretty fucking awesome. Yeah. Um, That's so yeah. And mixing it, I mean, the, the songs are really long, really mm -hmm. long. And there's a lot going on, a lot of gear shifts. Um, and the mixes took a while and it's a really loud record. Yeah. What else do you want to know? Well, I want to know about mixing that record all analog. I mean, obviously Metallica had done some analog records, um, but what was the pro especially with long songs like that and you have two mixers going, I mean, would you wrap up a song and then pull it off the console or did you guys oh, yeah. have to do any yeah, calls? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you're on a console, you're mixing one song at a time. Yeah. There were projects like some of the Neil Diamond stuff it was few enough tracks that I could fit two on the console at the same time. And my returns would just stay hmm. the same for effects and things like that. But keeping track of the flying faders stuff became right. like crazy because I would have to work on both at the same time. I have notes on both, but it was the only way it was going to make it through the record because 
it was taking a while for people to get back to me and we had to get it done. Yeah. But with Metallica, there's no fucking way you were going to do that. So um, I had Jason Gossman was assisting me. Yeah. And amazing assistant. I mean, he's an amazing engineer and producer too, but he's a fucking good assistant. And we just documented the hell out of it. And we ended up having to do recalls. Like there, the last night before mastering, I think I had to recall six songs and he had to go because he had to be somewhere. And yeah. I was up through the night until about 11 o'clock the next morning doing the recalls and printing, which meant a new recall because yeah. I could never remember everything that I changed. I was trying to keep track of it and use a red Sharpie instead of the pencil. And But uh, yeah, that was a fucking nightmare at the end. But yeah, it was, you know, I still think that record sounds really aggressive. I think, you know, a little dynamic range would be nice, whatever. But mm -hmm. the other thing, um, and I'm not going to go into it, but it's mm -hmm. it. There are versions of those mixes that are not quite as loud. Mm -hmm. That's all I need sure. to say. I, yeah. I mean, I think where where we left off, it was loud, but it wasn't as crazy as it as it ended up. And but it it ended up being the record that the band and Rick wanted. Period. Yeah. That's. Right. You know and that's the end of the story so um but yeah it was cool it was another one where i'm in my garage mixing this record and i met james and lars once at the very end we were listening to mixes and that's when i then had to go off and do all these recalls um yeah but it very little interaction with the band other than calls and emails and stuff yeah yeah amazing um I want to talk about the that was the record that the band wanted to make for a minute, and I know um, I I think you want to glaze over it a little bit, but I'm not sure. But well, um, it's it's also because like there are things that could be said, but there's no point, like sure. you know about yeah. other roles on the record and just things like that. Which mm -hmm. you know the worst thing you can do, and it actually happened on that record, is to say stuff out loud that doesn't need saying because it just mm -hmm. starts to point at people. And there's no point. Everybody working on that record was working on the same record. And everybody working on that record was making a record that was approved by the band and by the producer. Yeah. So that's the record we were making, period. Yeah. It doesn't matter who did what and when and in what order. Yeah. You know. Uh, personally, I, I love the record because, um, one thing, like when I first heard that record, it, it's the same thing. Like at first, um, you hear the snare from St. Anger and you go, huh? Like your engineer brain goes off or whatever, you know? But then if you stop and think about it for a second, it's like, this is Metallica. You don't make records at this level and make a mistake of the snare is ringy. It's not a mistake. That's an artistic decision, you know? And that's like listening to that record. The whole thing to me is an artistic statement. It's not about like, well, I would never push a limiter that hard. You know, that's me just interjecting. Yeah, and it's, it, but I always thought it, it was kind of crazy. And to be honest, yeah. just as a technical thing, it's not that loud from pushing a limiter from the mix mm -hmm. standpoint. It was right. pushing consoles. Yeah. And that's why it had to be that loud. It was it wasn't like, oh, it's a quiet mix and now we'll just smash it with a limiter. Yeah. It was the consoles to the point where Greg had to have them disconnect the meters on the API because those meters are hard plastic and they're in those like plastic rectangular shells. And when they hit the edge they're really loud and he couldn't yeah. work quietly because they're all going plank 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 <laughs> so he had he got him disconnected yeah so that he, yeah. he could actually hear the mix when he worked quietly yeah so it, it is it's the sound of it and people are like well you can always just turn it up but i mean that's it's not an ignorant thing to say because it is true but it's not the same mm -hmm. it's not yeah. that there was a quiet mix that got turned up there was a loud mix yeah and right. it wouldn't have been the same if it wasn't loud because you're talking about all the stuff people talk about with analog that they think is magic is right. that it's harmonic distortion and it turns into eq and it turns into limiting yeah yeah so you know yeah that yeah um so i'm just thinking of some other examples of this for for the pyramids people um 
I believe Greg Wells did this at in Sunset or at Sunset Sound Studio A on the console. He kind of showed pushing into the console and getting that drive and then finding a spot, oh, like making yeah. that decision. And also yeah. Joe Ciccarelli did that on that same console actually too. But well, yeah, what you're a, talking about just driving. John's thing. thing apparently on acoustic guitar was always keep on Neves, just keep cranking the preamp until it's way too distorted and then back off one. One. <laughs> Nice. And that's it, which is yeah. five dB. You know, it's five dB steps. But yeah. yeah, that was it. It's like do what the gear does. Take advantage of it. Because at one point, I had a guy from Avid, and we were doing listening tests. It's when they were developing heat, mm -hmm. like the sound of the console. And I was super excited about it because Dave Hill, who unfortunately died not that mm -hmm. long ago, yeah. did the algorithms, and he's the one who did the Phoenix plugin, and he did hardware that does tape emulation kind of stuff long before anyone else was doing it mm -hmm. and so we did listening tests because i'm like man the neves just got a thing and whatever and when we did it with reasonable levels double blind it was exactly the same flip the phase mm. exactly the same except one of them has some noise mm. it, there's absolutely no difference until you start pushing stuff and that's when it's crazy different and then you yeah. just decide whether you like it or not yeah. And one of the reasons I don't mix on the Neve anymore is because I don't always like it, but you're stuck mm -hmm. with it. So yeah. anyway, enough about yeah. that. I love that though. I mean, that's, that's a great thing. Like if you want to put that in your, you know, little encyclopedia of what does it sound like when you push a console, you have Metallica St. Anger. Right. Not St. Anger, Death Magnetic. Or sorry, Death Magnetic. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I, was thinking yeah, I mean, it, and that's more than just that, but yes, that, that's what it is. There is something in the aggression of it, even without the dynamic range that they were really responding to. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. That's yeah. It's expression. And I think it's great. Santiago wants to know why it wasn't louder. <laughs> well, cause we'd already won the loudness war. So there was no reason yeah, like, to, what's the point? to go louder than that. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Cool. Okay. Uh, DMK-75 says, guitars. That's true. Lots of them. Lots of I them. I didn't record them, so mm -hmm. I can't tell you too much about it. I just know that James' right hand is a machine. Mm. Like, the picking is insane. Yeah. And then he'd double it, and sometimes you'd think it was one performance on two amps kind of thing. Yeah. Wow. Like, yeah, just, just crazy. And obviously the solos... Are incredible um but i didn't i didn't track any of the guitars so yeah i don't know what to say about those really yeah how about in mixing anything special that you know comes to mind of how you treated them and how many layers there were stuff like that i really don't remember i mean i don't think it was a gigantic number of layers i w would be surprised if there were more than two of anything mm. to be honest because a lot of times when you layer stuff especially when it's fast it just gets mushy and it's actually it sounds smaller if you get mm -hmm. a good guitar player and get two good performances that hard pan as a rhythm track is gigantic mm -hmm. and when you add more really you're just changing the tone so you could reamp into another amp that has that's more or less distorted and you'll get a totally different envelope to the sound and you know it can sound like another uh performance but it isn't mm -hmm. so it's tight enough rhythmically even though it will be messy in a different way um and then yeah i mean solos and other riff parts i mean there there are lots of guitars but you can hear all of them it's mm. not like oh there are six guitars that go together to make something yeah sure okay and then another uh guitar question so uh, Romeo Rivera, how did you get those guitars on the day that never comes so 3D like? Was it the recording or did a preamp help? Um, um, I'm trying to think. I'm not even sure that I mixed that one. So hmm. was that the first single off the record? I think it was. Uh, I can let you know. In which case, that was Greg. Mm -hmm. Um so yeah i don't know i mean it a lot of that would have been the tracking like the clean stuff was all not all but a lot of it was through uh jc120 so it's got mm -hmm. that little bit of chorus and it's got two speakers and the speakers always sound a little different so mm -hmm. even though it's one performance it's got this amazing stereo beginning to the sound just because of 
the guitar and the guitar player, but also the amp. Mm -hmm. Awesome. I mean, I um, would use like really, really slow moving modulation, like mm -hmm. a ridiculously slow moving flanger into a re really slow moving auto panner that isn't going all the way, just gives you movement, but you don't notice it. And that's behind the solid clean version of it. And I don't mean clean, I mean, it could be distorted. It doesn't matter what it is, but that gives it this like motion behind it. That's mm -hmm. surreal. You know, it's not a natural sounding thing. Right. Right. Awesome. Um, I'm going over to title right now because I want to, uh, list off the songs, unless you remember the ones that, that you mixed. I won't remember. I'm not so, going to remember. Because Spotify doesn't tell us this stuff. Oh, I think you guys are both listed on... According to title, you're both listed on every song. Exactly, because they didn't bother finding out which songs any either of us had mixed. There you go. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, let's see what else we got on Death Magnetic here. So one second. Uh, we are done with that one. Jed likes the record. Thanks. Awesome. So that was that was exactly it. Mm -hmm. Um the uh, reminiscent of the older albums. Like that's Rick's thing. I mean the the Black Sabbath record I mixed, which somehow that's not mm -hmm. on our list, is it? Oh right. Um it is now. But it's very much that. It's like, hey, let's go back to the core of what made you guys like one of the most popular bands in the world mm -hmm. and figure out what that is. And I think that was in the writing of the Metallica record and in the writing and even the sound of the uh, Sabbath record, they got Eleni, which is what Tony had played through on all of the early records, Eleni amp. And he stopped using them because they're really unreliable. And Greg found one and he brought it in and it caught on fire. But they used mm. it for a while before it went up in flames, like literally. Yeah, that's crazy. Um okay sorry i'm just checking it i want to hit everything we can That's all right on the metallica thing here yeah um yeah. <laughs> people laughing about the meters uh yeah i don't i don't know <laughs> well they can sound totally wrong to you i mean i yeah. think that's the biggest thing is is that it's nothing but opinion mm-hmm and the a popular record is just something where a lot of people like it right yeah. but there's so many records and artists that have cult followings mm -hmm. and it's not because other people haven't heard it necessarily it's that it only appeals to a narrow group mm -hmm. so i think and this is the other thing that i would say goes along with the only thing that matters is what comes out of the speakers but this is more of a life thing is always identify what is actually just your opinion and never state your opinion as fact. Yes. And it keeps it keeps relationships better. Conversations go a lot easier because there's a little bit like, hey, I think, not mm -hmm. it is, when the other person disagrees. And maybe you're going to point something out that they will latch on to and like, oh, right, I hadn't listened to it that way or or yeah. whatever but yeah it's easy for something to sound totally wrong to you but i think this is i mean and so this is touching on a motorcycle thing where i'd been listening to them for 15 years before i worked with them and in my head it was like oh man the drums could be punchier and blah 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 and that was the record that i wanted to make and to ever assume that a band isn't making the records they want to make is just arrogant and I was super mm. arrogant about it. I'm like, well, you know, that's uh, the, if if I could make a record with them, then it would be what they love. And mm. like, no, they've been making records for 20 years at that point, and they love them. Otherwise, mm. they wouldn't make them. So right. yeah, right. So I'm not I'm not trying to pick on anybody, but I think no. And it could just yeah. be a wording thing, and perhaps English is not even your first language, which you know that's well written if it right. isn't but yeah um yeah i, I think it, it's just it you don't want to say something if you can just think of it this way for someone who likes the record that would like be trying to make them feel bad like oh yeah. you're wrong and right. you don't want to do that yeah you know, there are plenty of and, other ways to make people feel bad 
<laughs> you would know behind your uh, between two shirts guy. <laughs> so exactly. We'll, we'll get exactly. to that. Nobody um, can get meaner than me. That's right. Yeah, or louder. Apparently. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, and he also says, uh, I remember a friend back in the day, uh, the first day of that release, screaming, this is the best Metallica sound ever. So there you go. Yeah. yeah. But also Metallica fans are, I don't even know what the word would be. They love the band so much that they hate them in some mm. ways. Like, mm -hmm. there's so many uh, Metallica fans, like, everything they've done since Ride the Lightning is shit, but they're still my favorite band in the whole world. Yeah. And, like, yeah. we got emails greg and i both got emails uh you know some death threats some like you've ruined my boyfriend's life you need to remix this record wow and like one of the things going around was that uh this is when rock band was huge yeah and yeah. so there were stems made for rock band yep and it was like oh god it sounds so much better on rock band like, where do you think the stems came from Right. We soloed everything and printed them from our mixes. Yeah. Yeah. So it was quieter maybe because Rock Band turned stuff down or maybe it just sounded bad or mm -hmm. quieter or darker or something coming out of the game console than a stereo. But mm -hmm. those stems are from the mixes. So, you know. Yeah. They had that same push into the into the gear, yeah. and they were getting the same clipping. Yeah, thing I mean, that the stereo bus wouldn't have been getting quite getting hit quite as hard. But I mean, mm -hmm. I don't think either of us had any dynamics processing on the stereo bus because it was just mm -hmm. the console. So yeah, the console probably wouldn't have gotten hit quite as hard, mm -hmm. but it wasn't like a night and day difference. I mean, we made sure that when you put up those stems, it was the mix. Yeah. Like right. We would phase it against the mix. And if it was anything other than modulation effects, mm. other than little blips here and there, yeah, something wrong and we got to go fix it. Go fix it. Right. Yeah. Wow. Um, one, one thing that I like remember, try to remember myself, but also like pass on to people too, is like, it's called decapitator for a reason, you know, like the sound toys plugin. You know, yeah, like I mean, that it's, is it's what's the Brian happening, Eno right? quote it's... that like all the limitations of the technology we have now will be that we hate. All the stuff we hate about today's technology is the stuff we will long for tomorrow. And that's yeah. it. Everybody loves harmonic distortion and clipping and noise. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There are many a plug-in around it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's an entire huge industry based on mm -hmm. that um <laughs> dmk i can't hear the shaker <laughs> is there a shaker I don't think there's a shaker. <laughs> uh so uh you kind of already answered this i don't know if there's anything else to add from jed uh how much back and forth happened between you and the band with that record uh quite a bit i mean the way most records worked if rick was producing is you'd go back and forth with rick first then it would go to mm -hmm. the band mm -hmm. and di with different bands that was different i don't think there was a huge amount there was a lot more on the sabbath record than on the metallica record i'm only just those mm. were not too far apart time wise and they're you know gigantic rock metal legacy acts and stuff so that's why i'm conflating um mm. yeah so most of the back and forth was at the end but there was definitely back and forth on each mix you know, as it was being done, but you'd start mm -hmm. with Rick and then you'd move on to the band. Yeah. Amazing. Um, did Rick usually act as the point of contact in those situations or would, were you uh, working directly? No, usually once the band was making notes, you just talk to the band. I mean, he didn't want to yeah. funnel that stuff. Sure. Yeah. And then if you ended up changing a lot, you'd go back to Rick. And if not, it was just done. You just you let know. him know. Yeah. Awesome. Um, uh, definitely worth putting up here. So once again, Dave Hill. Yeah. Audio. So that was a loss. Thanks for that one, Dave. Yeah. Yeah. And also one of the most fun people at trade shows. Yeah. Leather <laughs> shorts and a Hawaiian shirt and a hat. Such a good guy. Yeah. And yeah, so down to earth too. He would he would talk to. Yeah, he was very anyone very but you, to talk to. right? Anybody but me. Yeah, I was gonna say he talked to me, but he he turned around. But, yeah yeah 
Kenneth says, you got to push it, push it, regarding <laughs> the levels. Uh, let me see what else we got here. Kenneth says, you won about the loudness wars. Anything specific about reamping? Uh, basically, I would usually record a DI, and then I would use the Little Labs PCP to go back out to an amp, just because it was perfect at matching um, impedances and level and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, definitely saving that question for later. That's a good one. And... We've had a couple people ask questions about your template. We'll have to get to that. I think that is all we got for Metallica on okay. here. Um, yeah, unless you have anything else that, that you remember no, from that. I think we got fun. through that relatively unscathed. So yeah, yeah. Let's, uh, let's just keep going. <laughs> so let's keep moving. Yeah. Uh, last question about it. How long did you work on that record? Do you remember if it was like a couple weeks or months? No, it was more than that. I don't remember. But yeah, I mean, it was probably a week of mix. And sometimes yeah. it's just because like, you know, Rick was out. And sure. so you'd wait for notes. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, it would... I would imagine it was taking me two days before I had anything to even send to him. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Um, well, on a different side of the spectrum, genre wise, we have Josh Groban. Josh Groban. <laughs> Another Rick thing. This is, I mean, definitely the, the period of time where I was doing a lot of stuff with Rick. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah i think he had done most of his records with david foster up until then um again fantastic producer and musician mm -hmm. but a very specific you know like he invented the type of production that he did on pop records you know mm -hmm. like he's the guy he's not the only one but you know that tambourine into a bunch of reverb like that was in the phil Spector stuff but then that became a thing on the clean pop instead of the wall of sound kind of thing so um and i think josh was just thinking about doing something else so uh you know and rick is a song guy as much as anything else and so at the beginning of the record we went to sound city actually and um just recorded piano and vocal a lot mm -hmm. of songs ton of songs just piano and voice and then uh they kind of chose the songs and then they got orchestrations done and you know, it was a little more than that, but basically that's what happened. And then we got to record all the orchestra with Al Schmidt at Capitol, which was awesome. And I know now for years, but that might be the first time I actually worked with him on a session. Cool. Yeah. And it was great. I sat at the console reading the scores and he was recording in his usual, like, why does it sound so amazing when he doesn't seem to be doing anything? way because he didn't do anything but it's amazing it was actually the first couple of days was difficult because we had a lot of people in that room and josh was playing piano live um so we had rhythm section if i'm getting this right i'm pretty sure we had did we have rhythm section or not maybe not maybe it was just like bass and piano and vocal and orchestra but it was a lot of people and the room was starting to get kind of blown up. I mean, mm. you know, you can acoustically blow stuff up the same way you can electrically. And it was difficult. And so, I mean, we used everything we got in the first couple of days because, you know, those sessions mm. are expensive. You're not gonna be like, oh, let's just try it again. <laughs> but um, yeah, Al, Al had to work probably a bit more because I think it was more players than he would have liked to have in that room mm. at a time. Um, the the live room at Capitol had a, a wall that you could open up and then you would have the the live room for A and B, but there was a session mm -hmm. going on in B. So we only had the A control room, and I, uh, A live room. And I think he would have preferred to have the whole thing, but it had panels, you know, variable acoustics. And we would just play with that because it was overblown, but it sounded dry. But if we mm -hmm. made it liver, then it was even messy. Like it was... It was a weird balance, but it turned out great. It turned out wow. really, really well. Um, uh, and let then, me pause you for a second there because I forgot yeah. to say the, the title of the record. So, um, yeah, for people who want to check this out, this was—I just had it in front of me. It was 
the um, War at Home from 2010. That's that's a song. That, that's a song. That's not the record. No. I'll get back to you with the record. Well, here, I'll look it up. <laughs> cool. I'll look it up. Awesome. Uh, yeah, and the when you say the room was blown up, can you kind of describe what that sounded like? It's just like like one of the characteristics of um, Al's recording is how open, you know, and how much mm -hmm. space there is. And that, uh, I think it's Illuminations. Is that right? Yeah, that's, that's Illuminations mm -hmm. uh, is the album. And so it just, it didn't have as much space because there were so many people playing. Mm. So, you know, his mic techniques were still impeccable. Everything sounded great and the balance was great, but it just didn't have the air around it that we're used to hearing from, you know, I mm -hmm. mean, his, his string recordings are spectacular. And this was just unbelievably great as opposed mm. to spectacular for the first day or so. And then he, you know, he sorted it out. Like it just, again, he just kind of sat there and did nothing. And all of a sudden it was completely amazingly spectacularly great wow yeah super cool yeah and sometimes though that's nothing to do with the recording sometimes it's the arrangement or the song or whatever you know i think we talked about this before when you're recording a band and sometimes the drums just start to sound terrible you're like well mm -hmm. what the hell is going on and then it turns out it's the song because you move on to a song that doesn't suck as much or the band is more into and all of a sudden everything sounds great Oof, yeah yeah right. i mean and and it's absolutely a sonic thing it's not like oh they're playing better it's just there's something not working musically and that ruins everything right so that stuff was all working i'm not saying that but it i don't know what it was yeah but it was something yeah awesome uh how long did you work on that record that one was was sort of quick because it uh i did all those demos with him at first the songwriting demos and then it didn't mm -hmm. come back to me until we were doing the strings i think and then um i was gonna i thought i was gonna mix it but then alan side started mixing mm -hmm. and because alan started doing the overdubs with him i mean and that made sense because you know alan comes from more of that world than i do certainly uh, but then there was one, The War at Home, I think was the song where, like I did quick roughs. And one of the things I'm really good at is very quick roughs. And I was mm. better when it was analog and on tape because you're throwing up faders and my mm. very quick balances, either to put a stereo mix on another reel of tape so we could overdub or just running cassettes at the end of the night, for whatever reason, those are good. And sometimes nice. it gets me in trouble because I can't, match them <laughs> and um i think they're at the war at home my mix that i did in like five minutes and it was a six minute song was better than anything they were getting so i ended up doing that one and i just started from my pro tool session because i'm like well there's no way in hell i'm going to start over yeah so wow yeah, yeah. very cool so you did but the I rough for that one in pro tools one. what's that you did the rough for that in pro tools then yeah Oh yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. That's great. Uh, okay, we have some other questions for this one coming in. But um, do you have any tips for people about how to do rough mixes like that? What Move are some very things that quickly. You do? But see, this is the thing. Like the way most people produce stuff now, you can't do rough mixes like that because you're mixing from the very beginning. You've got sure. automation going. There are a million plugins and whatever. This is why when I'm tracking. I try to have no plugins in. I'll have one parallel mono thing for kick and snare just to get a little more punch out of them if I need it. Mm -hmm. And that's it. Unless it's like a specific sound for a specific instrument, I won't use anything because otherwise I'm stuck. Mm -hmm. I'm actually mixing when I should be producing and recording. So the key to those roughs is to have almost nothing going on and just get an amazing balance and then maybe you pop it through a compressor or a limiter just to glue it a little bit and print it and you spend very little time on it like yeah. a lot of records at the end of tracking um you do roughs on the entire record the second half of the day because mm. everyone's leaving and they want to take mixes home that happened on audio slave with dave Schiffman and me um the 
go first Gogol Bordello record, I did those roughs in about two and a half hours. And then mm. those were the things I had to beat for the mixes and it was hard. And like, why is that hard? I just throw the faders up again and it'll be great. Yeah. And I actually would have time to do stuff. And but I still it was really difficult. But it's because wow. it's all balance. Nothing but balance. Yeah. Very cool. Uh, yeah. Cool. All right. I could go off on that for a while, but we'll move on to D Wolf's question of how many times do you find that getting a quick mix up without overthinking was working better than overanalyzing? I think we just like answered said. that. Yeah, yeah. It's a great way to work. I mean, I think that even though I'm, you know, my signal flow can be kind of involved, though it's a lot simpler than it used to be. I try to mix like that all the time. And that's mm -hmm. why I won't sit and work on something if I'm not being creative and like, oh, great, I'm going to do this. Oh, that I got to work on that. I got to work on that. Like, if I'm not flowing while I'm working on it, it's dangerous to work on it because you'll just look for something to do and you'll fuck it up. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, do you remember who the drummer was on that record? No. I was quick. He doesn't list the credits. <laughs> well, hold on a second. Uh, let me look on all music. It lists. Let's see. Well, Al V played trombone. I can tell you that for free. Uh, While you're looking, uh, Six of One or Adrian as we know him, uh, is he says the reason's because you were playing live, which means never erase the first take for the rough mix. <laughs> you know, just like a first take off the floor. Yeah. Um, hold on. Hold on. Because, of course, the names are in alphabetical order. So, I mean, I could just search for the word drums, but this oh. is kind of funny. Uh, Dave says he found it on all music. Um, Dave, let us know who it was. I'll put it up on the screen for everybody. Uh, okay. And... Because a lot of... <laughs> people why am i not searching for the word drums let's do that here's a random question for you uh it shouldn't take too much side brain power wow there is no drummer listed are you sure there's like drum kit on this record there's percussion with the orchestral percussion but hmm. i don't think there's a drummer he'll uh That's why he'll respond to you in the 20 question. seconds there you go Uh, D Wolf it wants to know on uh, Gorgo Bordello if you wore purple while mixing it. No, <laughs> I did not. I I have one purple shirt and I've probably worn it twice. Nice. I'm going to send it to my son so he can have a shirt because <laughs> I don't wear it. There you go. Okay. I think it's time for the next record, which would be Gogo Bordello. Coco Bordello. So the first time I worked with them uh, was a Rick production. Um, you can find the name of it. I don't remember because I'm bad with names. Uh, so uh, that was recorded. Transcontinental Hustle. Sorry. Yes, Transcontinental Hustle. So that was recorded in a house um, in Malibu because Rick lived in Malibu and he wanted to work in Malibu a lot, which makes sense. It's close to his house and he's in charge. And the band could stay there too. So that worked out. Um, it was a really unbelievably difficult live room. Hmm. Like he wanted me to just come and set up some mics and then they were going to like do pre production, but while recording. But they didn't want to pay me to be there every day. And usually I'd done that a few times. I'd just walk in, we'd set up some microphones, I'd go home, everything would be cool. And it took about two weeks before Rick was okay enough with the drum sound that they could even do that bit. And when it came to recording the record, it took forever to get a drum sound that we could use. And I don't begin to understand why exactly, but it was, yeah, really, really difficult. But um, working on the record, we did, uh, you know, a lot of the tracking and tons of time spent on the guitar overdubs. Eugene is just a force of nature. Like, he's incredible. And he's got so much energy. If you haven't heard the band, 
you need to go listen to it. Uh, plus, he's Ukrainian, which means he's having a very hard time the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. Um, but super, super talented and just this gigantic vision of himself and the world and arts and all the rest of it. Um, and we ended up, um, I want to look up song titles on that, actually. Hold on, because there's one song I wanted to talk about. Uh, Goldbordello, Discography, Transcontinental Hustle. We're getting there. We're getting yeah, there. Hold up here. There's a lot of songs. Um, oh, 13. Yeah. Um, I think it's when universes collide. I'm pretty sure that's it. So it, there was a song and it was this really, really slow build. And it just started off really, really quietly. And it ended up like a fucking freight train. Mm. And we'd been tracking it like i don't know for we'd sort of work on it every few days for a bit and like that's the shape of it's not right the shape of it's not right and then um yeah and that could be the wrong song i don't remember but from my <laughs> description it should be easy to find sure and then there was a day um where it was just us and sort of waiting for rick because the only stuff left is he hadn't necessarily heard and they wanted to talk about arrangement it's like all right look we still don't have this song let's just do it and they did a take and i made notes on the lyrics of like one to ten i mean it wasn't that but notes of the lyrics like okay here's where it needs to be starting to do this thing. And then here's where, like, we hadn't mapped it because it was just they were going to feel it. But it always ended up either peaking too early or too late, or like it didn't make sense. And so just did these little things. They did one take, and it was like, holy shit. Hmm. And that was it. And we did very few overdubs on that song. And then for mixing, I was terrified of it because I thought, well, this is going to be, it was so hard to play that I will screw it up. Like mm -hmm. I'm going to fuck it up. And I left it for last. And I don't, I mean, there, I'm sure there were a couple of revisions, but it is probably the least amount the fewest revisions let's use words that actually make sense the fewest revisions of any mix i've ever done for rick like wow you know a couple of things and done because once we had it like you couldn't break it mm. it was just it was it so you just had to put up the faders get a balance a couple of things you know and it was yeah. done yeah. and then from that they um then they called i got a call where was i I'd gone to the Potluck Conference, um, which what tape used to be the Tape Pop Conference, and then it, it turned into the Potluck Conference. Mm -hmm. And I only went once. And uh, so I just landed at the airport. I think it was there. No, 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 no. I'd flown to New York because I remember I was at the baggage claim and my phone went and my mom was there. And uh, there was a call from my manager saying like, hey, um, Google's management called and they want to talk to you about working on the next record. And I think at that point, I'd kind of stopped doing as much stuff for Rick. And it was like I was doing more stuff on my own. And it was it was hard to go back into that because it's a you know, it was amazing. And I learned a ton and blah, blah, blah. But it's a very mm -hmm. different way of working than when you're not working for him. It's just it's different. And so I was thinking like, well, I don't know. I mean, because that record was really difficult, especially with the studio. And I just thought, man, if this is going to be a repeat of that, I love the band and it turned out great, but I'm not sure I want to do that. And he's like, no, 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 to produce. I'm like, what? Yes, I will do that. <laughs> and so uh, for the record that's after Transcontinental Hustle, which is called... Um, uh, I can't pronounce it. Sorry, where is it? <laughs> the it looks oh, Pura Vita Conspiracy. Oh, okay, there's a chance. Um, Pura, sorry, Pura, not Pura, Pura Vita Conspiracy. Um, mm. that's the other thing about that band, super international. I mean, from all over the place. Mm. Uh, the first record, uh, the guitarist was from Israel, the bass player on both records is from Ethiopia. Uh, one of the main uh, percussionists and sort of MCs is fucking awesome is uh, from 
I'm going to get it wrong, so I'm not going to say South American country, but I'm going to get it wrong. Uh, so yeah, from all over the place, and mm. just it's great thing with with Eugene as the the linchpin. So anyway, so for that record, we went to come on Sonic Ranch, uh, oh, the studio wow. in Texas, yeah, which I'd never been to, and it turns out it's the only time I've ever worked there. Uh, but yeah, so we went there and we cut the entire record. I think we were there for two weeks. Let me pause you. So you were the producer. Did you choose the studio? Yeah. Yeah. We nice. were thinking maybe we could go to La Fabrique. It had to be something residential because there were so mm -hmm. many people in the band. Like there was no way. Plus, um, I didn't mention the accordion player and the violin player, both insane musicians, mm -hmm. um, both from Russia and uh, Sergi, Serge, oh, for fuck's sake, I'm going to get his name wrong. So I'm not going to bother. Don't. He had been in one of the top orchestras in Russia for years and years and years. But then he's like, I want to play with Gogo Bordello. Like he changed what he did. And the accordion player was unbelievable. Like just in between songs, he would start playing some stuff. And like, you've got to be kidding me. The sounds mm -hmm. he would get out of the accordion and all the rest of it. it it's like when you hear somebody who's really good on harmonica and you realize like, oh, that's not a toy. Like that's a real instrument. And I don't think that people think that, um, oh, Sergei, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I don't think that, that people think an accordion is a toy, but it's, you know, people think of it as polka, et cetera, et cetera, folk songs or whatever. But mm -hmm. no, I, anyway, so yeah, the musicianship in that band was, was spooky. So we were trying to find a place to go. And then I think it was Ryan Hewitt said about Sonic Ranch. I think he just worked there. And he said, you should check it out. And so we went and made a record yeah. and it nice. was awesome. Yeah. That's great. That, that place looks so fun. How long are you guys yeah. there? Again, I don't think it was that long. I think we had three weeks and that was including, um, uh, pre-production and again, all the tracking, like mm -hmm. we couldn't leave anything else to be recorded. I think Eugene might've recorded a couple of little overdubs or whatever after he left but um yeah we had three weeks there and it was full on like we took mm. we took sundays off because i just knew that i couldn't do it so you know but i had two days off in the three weeks basically and uh ate some amazing mexican food these women would mm. come in and cook and it was just incredible and on right. Sundays, they wouldn't come in, but they would leave this gigantic pile of burritos for us. <laughs> Just wait, hold on. I kind of want to go ask like Dolly to make an image of a, a, a pile of burritos. Do it. <laughs> do it. All right, I might do it while you tell us the next story. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and hold on, hold on. I got to look something else up because there was another thing that, that is very... Um, Hold on. This is sort of a. You just got to give me a second because this is imp it's not important, but it's important to me. Mm -hmm. So. This band and you will know us by the trail of dead. Oh, my gosh. You're, you're talking band. my love language I right now. I fucking love that band. I love and that it's band. A record called. Um, uh, 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 called Tau of the Dead. Yes. Which. I just listened to it again last week or something like that. That is a fucking masterpiece. Yeah. It is like a lot of their records, the brand new record actually sounds nothing like the old records, but mm -hmm. there's a, there's like a writing style and a melodic style that they have the same way Deftones do, Yeah, you know, where it's obviously a Deftones record and that's a good thing. It's not a, a bad thing. But this record is somehow for me just like miles ahead of all the other records. And the guy who produced it was um, Chris Frenchy Smith. And he was there doing another record while I was there doing the Gogo Bordello thing. And I fanboyed all over him. I like I kept wanting to go visit him while he was I mean he's supposed to be making a record and I just yeah. kept showing up like hey man um what's going on like it just 
just to like hang out in the room and it, yeah he was amazing and in the other studio was hansen okay umbop and like yeah they were awesome it's one I've of those things this. where you know you yeah. get success early on with a certain thing and everyone just assumes that's who you are mm -hmm. and like the monkeys were a band that was cast for a tv show but they were actually really good mm. and hansen exactly the same way they yeah th their songs were so well crafted and so well done and cool like really cool yeah and um, so th those were the three i don't remember the name of the band that chris is working with but those were the three bands in and we'd all eat together because you know you want to get some mole like it's only in one place everybody comes right. in the little hacienda and has some mole so that, that was awesome yeah it was really good oh that's great um okay uh dolly's still working on our image we're gonna get back with it in a minute okay uh, Dolly's. Still yeah, well, it gave me something back, but I'm gonna I'm gonna keep talking to it a little bit. Okay. Uh, shall we move on to the wedding present? Yeah, we can move on to the wedding present. All right. So, for those of you that don't know, the wedding present is uh, an English band. They've been around now. It's got to be forty years since their first record. Mm -hmm. um, David Gedge is the main singer and songwriter, and I was recommended through. I'm almost positive it was the guy who'd been doing sound for the Duke Spirit when they were in the States. I might be confusing some things. So if I get details wrong, I really apologize. But uh, recommended me to work with them because I mm. had just moved over to the UK. And so I drove to Brighton, which is where they were, where Dave was living and where the band was at the time. And if you don't know, British geography and roads, just know that to get to Brighton from where we are sucks. Mm. And you've got to go on the M25, which is the circular motorway around London. And it's a piece of shit. And it's basically a parking lot most of the time or a car mm. park, as they say here. Um, so I and I was just going down for the day. So I got pretty lucky with the traffic on the way down and went to a rehearsal and just like anytime I walk into a rehearsal, I just immediately have stuff to say. And like, I was supposed to kind of meet the band and go have lunch, but I just started like, well, look, if we're going to do this, should I just like tell you what I think about some of the stuff in the songs? And I kind of mm. would just give them notes and whatever. And David was like, cool. And they, I mean, almost all of them ended up being incorporated. I mean, not like, you know, whatever, none of them were that spectacular, but just length of sections and stuff. And then we, uh, we, I don't think I recorded that record. I think they went off and did it with someone else. And then I mixed it. Hmm. Um, is that right? Some of it, I know I was there for the recording and some of it, I don't remember, but I ended up doing a, a few records with him. So I could just be confusing what happened on which record. And for, for those wondering the one that we're talking about, which I believe was first was Valentina. Or was that also? Yes. It was Valentine. Yes. Okay. Am I listed as a as an engineer or just mixing? Let me, I'll get back to you on that in one second. Oh, look. Okay, you look, and I'm going to show everybody what it was like to record at Sonic Ranch. Oh, hold on. I want to experience see the day off. So hold on one second here. <laughs> okay. Here we go. Let's see. It's one of them. Okay. Now, whatever you just did, put my name in and it will put me in that picture in a very fucked up way. There are I enough tried. pictures of me on the internet that it actually does that. I, I used I didn't use Dolly, I used something else. And I said I wanted a picture of me mixing in the box with cats. And it was and fucked it up. Oh man. So I tried to put you in there and it said um that due to blah 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 I can't put the celebrity mixing engineer Andrew Sheps in the video. <laughs> celebrity. Well, yeah, cuz I'm yeah. on a webcast. So, you know. Right, there you go. You have a webcast, yeah. Um and this was image number 2 that it gave us. So this is uh live pictures from Sonic Ranch Studios. Yeah. On Sunday morning. Yeah. yeah, and I love that you use the console as a lunch counter. Yeah, yeah, two of them. 
Yeah, that's pretty much it. I mean, some of those burritos are not wrapped very well, I got to say. Yeah, I told it to be a little sloppy. <laughs> okay. All right. So, Valentina, um, yeah, apparently I'm the assistant as well, but no, mixing and producer. So I did not track that record. Mm -hmm. I don't remember exactly what they did, but like he, they were ridiculously fast. And David, I mean, he's very serious about it, but he's not precious about it. Like we mixed the whole album, I think, in four days, and that was still on the console. And they were wow. resurfacing the road outside of my house. So we had to take like an hour long break and watch them put the new tarmac down because it's kind of fascinating. Mm. So it yeah. Um, and there's one song on that record. I think it's the last track. It's certainly the last one that we mixed. Um no, I, I don't think it's Mystery Day. First of all, Deer Caught in the Headline is fucking epic. It's awesome. Um, I don't remember which one it is, but it'll be really obvious when you listen to it. There's one that has two drum kits. And the reason I mixed it last was because, you know, my console's set up to mix and I'm yeah. in a box. And so nothing is very flexible. And I knew... I would have to like change the way stuff was set up on buses and things like that. So I mixed it by putting, I think the kick drums are both cheating towards the center and the, no, they're not actually. It's full one kid on the left, one kid on the right. And you can listen to either side of the mix and it is the song because the vocals in both sides, the main guitar is in both sides, the bass is in both sides. But the groove is totally different between the two drum kits. Whoa. Okay. Uh, so I can link this for everybody. What's the name of that song? Did you? I don't remember. You, the, just the, to it out. you need to listen to the whole album because you have to hear Deer Caught in the Headlights anyway. The, and the songs are short for the okay. most part. Let me go get a link for everybody. Um, uh, it's called, yeah, Valentina. Okay. So I'll have that in just a moment here. And then, uh, um, how did you get, um, how did you get involved with that record? Well, like I said, it, I was just recommended by someone and like, Hey, you should work with these guys. And so yeah. then I went and met them and then I worked nice. with them. Uh, and then going, going, uh, which was the next record. I'm pretty sure. Did I record that? Maybe I didn't. I don't remember now. I feel like I recorded them, but it might be. Yeah, engineer, mixing, producer. Okay, so mm -hmm. that one I did record. Uh, yes, yes, because that one we recorded at uh, a studio in Liverpool that unfortunately is no longer there. Um, something Street. Ugh. I hate when you have to use specific words for things because Par Street, P A W -R, R Street studios um and apparently i actually saw the guy who was running it and he is i believe in the midst of setting up a new par street studios but not in the uh, original space then the, the the live room sounded really good and the control room was weird as hell because there was a huge pillar right in the middle behind the console mm -hmm. so like you could sit at the console and be in the middle but you couldn't no one else could be in the middle or anywhere close to the middle because there's this huge round concrete pillar mm. and so a very weird control room to work in um and we recorded that really fast a few days nice. yeah um and then uh and then i mixed it and that's when i moved over and my speakers were set up in the caravan in the field so oh, right no one ever came to work with me there except them so I'd done all the mixes because it was all in the box and I sent them. And David's like, well, we can just go through the notes in a day. There's no point in me sending the stuff. And like, mm. all right, I'm in a caravan. Just so you know, he's like, that's cool. <laughs> and so it's the only time anyone came and worked with me in the caravan. That's pretty cool, though. Yeah. 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 Again, just, I, you know, that's it's starting to be a, a little bit of a theme here and there with you where you just, you know, you just make the record. You're not obsessing about this stuff and i love well that. i mean in part of me always felt like why can't i have a normal career why wasn't i an assistant engineer and mm -hmm. then work my way up why didn't i work at a studio why didn't i learn to mix from lots of different people by being in the room when they mix mm -hmm. and why didn't i just make records in a studio like mm -hmm. that seems as though 
it would be slightly less stressful maybe i'm sure but then <laughs> i just it's this combination of feeling like it's got to get done you know the only way out is through so mm -hmm. you're going to get it done and at the same time like well i don't want to spend the band's money to go into a studio mm -hmm. when like who the fuck am i you know like whatever like, let's do it here because it's low risk and if you don't like it you'll still have money to go somewhere else and you know this is my imposter syndrome sort of taking over so it's kind of a combination of that yeah um yeah so it might have been really cool to just make records in studios but i think that that's like a pipe dream anyway because most people don't Mm -hmm. You know, I've talked to, to Alan Mulder about what well, we did a, you know, four hour interview with him. Yeah, definitely one of my favorite record makers ever. He's made so many records that I absolutely love. And every once in a while, I listen to something, and I just email him and say, Alan, I just listened to this again. And holy shit. And thank you for making records. So it's like, mm -hmm. hey, thanks, man. And I do it all the time. And one of them, it was a Swerve Driver record. And he said, yeah, we made that in a rat infested basement in two weeks. Like, it's just, <laughs> yeah, it happens. And in some ways, I think, you know, it just pushes you because you can't think about anything other than the record. You're not thinking yeah. about the food budget and the lounge and what you're going to do over the weekend before you come back and work some more. And, and mm -hmm. you have to make stuff work so you don't rely on things. You just like you're aware of absolutely everything and you get it done. And it's mm -hmm. I'm sure that's the way most people's careers are. There are very few people who just I mean, I think Al Schmidt's one of the few people who probably didn't do that many guerrilla recordings. Right, right. Yeah, but most people my age have done that. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, it's a real world scenario. It's just it's interesting because you also have done it with bands that, you know, like Weezer, you would just think they'll just go wherever they want to go, you know, but yeah, you still do but it. They like it, too. And, yes. You know, right, right. Which is part of the fun. Yeah, yeah. It, it's a field trip. It's maybe in a way it's a little like I, when I talk about when I'm mixing on headphones, there's no jeopardy because I'm not mixing yet. I'm just like, because it isn't this very expensive studio where holy shit, we have to be unbelievably productive right now. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing that will make you less productive than knowing you have to be productive. So being in some other place, it takes all that away, even if it is costing you money and you only have a certain amount of time, like that Fabes record, we were in a studio but we only had one day per song and we knew that's what we had and we couldn't take longer and when we did the two versions of one song that day like oh fuck, are we behind now and it just gives you something else to think about and it makes it different and i yeah. think that's good it's like it's a distraction in a really good way that makes you focus more or yeah something. right no that's great yeah okay um Let's see. I I found an answer to your question though that you just had. So you just asked the question. Uh, you said, "Who am I?" And uh, I did get this answer for you. So <laughs> this is. Uh, hold is on. This from ChatGPT. It is. Yeah. Oh uh, come on. <laughs> oh, it's not even letting me. Uh, this is going to be an expensive joke. <laughs> I'll what, just read you it out pay for you. To copy it. No, well, it's not letting me paste it into the YouTube comments. Just just I'm screenshot it. it and put it up. Oh, yeah. There you go. Wait, I'll just share my screen. Why don't I do that? Why don't you do that? <laughs> there you go. All right. That's enough. Get we rid have of some it. Questions. Right, right, right. Uh, we have some questions coming up um, about your thoughts on AI, which uh, also leads me to... I have some is... very interesting thoughts about it, actually. Um, that have sure. changed a lot recently because I am fortunate to know some really fucking smart people. So, All yeah. Right. Um, another thing I don't think we've mentioned, and it's probably around the same time ish, is this band Act Rights. Mm. I don't think we've mentioned them. Okay. So, just really quickly, I went to uh, South by Southwest for the first time in some year or other, and I don't remember what year it was. And it turns out I'm like ridiculously obsessive and OCD. So I didn't know what bands I was going to go see. And instead of like just asking some people like, OK, every band that's listed as they're going to play has 
a YouTube link or something like that. It actually wasn't even YouTube links at that point. Most of them, it was like an MP3 and you could click on it and play. I listened to every single band. It took me about three and a half weeks and I did hmm. it for a few hours every night. Every single band. And I came across this band, Act Rights, and it was awesome. It was so exciting. I mean, like it sounded, this was recorded in a rehearsal room or something like that. It did not sound good, but it was amazing. Like, okay, I'm definitely doing that. And I had my calendar all laid out. I'm going to go see this band and that band and that band. So, okay, so that one, I think it was the next year that Royal Blood were there. And I saw them mm. play to maybe like 100 people. They'd already had that first big single. But mm -hmm. this was the year when Hozier was there. Mm. And he played upstairs in an Irish pub fitting. <laughs> um, and there were maybe 30 people, maybe. But Take Me to Church had just started rolling. And so I saw him play. Uh, I was amazing and met him because I was going to be mixing the record. Um, and so that was awesome. And just the thing about Hozier, I guess we can talk more about him later, is that I've seen him play probably eight or nine times at this point, maybe 10. And every time I see him, the crowd is like exponentially bigger. Mm -hmm. So he went from 30 to seeing him in an arena, just crushing it. So crazy. Yeah. Anyway, that's amazing. So we get to um, act rights and my very good friend, Philip Broussard is there as well. He came to South by and he ended up being like the best South by buddy ever. Um, he's like, we're going to, he came with me to all the stuff that I was going to go see. And I went with him to see stuff and he knew other people. And so it was awesome. And we went to the gig and it was, I don't know how late it was. It wasn't crazy late, but it was dark outside and they started playing and they were on a stage that was too small for the four of them to be on it. So like they kept having to get off the little stage and it was one of the best shows I've ever seen. At one point, the singer, Ajit Debras, um, at one point, he kicked his shoes out the open window into the street, never to be seen again. <laughs> and he did the thing where he pop an Alka-Seltzer in your mouth, so you're frothing at the mouth on the last song. <laughs> Just nuts. It's so good. So I actually, Philip and I both talked to them afterwards, like, man, this is so fucking good. And it's one of the only times I have signed a band for mm -hmm. my label. And so they, uh, they recorded the album, like, almost like as a surprise, like we were talking about, it. I was hearing songs like, okay, cool. And we were trying to figure out because they were from Austin, like, how are we going to do this? And they knew one of the guys in White Denim, White Denim, which is a band from Austin, super old school. They record to tape or not, or but like no overdubs and all this shit. And so they went in and recorded in two days and like the whole record done. Mm. Like, OK, so they just, you know, got in touch with me on a Wednesday and said, hey, we recorded the record this week. Like, but it's only Wednesday. Like, yeah, I know we went in Monday. So that was done. And they sent me everything. And I was still mixing on the fucking console. So schedule, I'm in the middle of these records and with Rick, the records could take forever. So finally I had this one day window, like that's it. Yeah. And I was supposed to be meeting someone for dinner on the West side of LA. And I was living in the Valley at seven. So at five o'clock I called him up and I said, look, it's going to have to be seven 30 cause I'm, almost done with this record <laughs> and i mixed all 12 songs in a day wow and awesome. it was awesome so that record took exactly three days and on the um on the the artwork because i loved when albums would say like recorded this date to this date and whatever so it says recorded this day and this day at this studio and yeah. mixed this day at this studio yeah and it's awesome and it's a gr we actually listened to it last night i finally got my stereo all like it's it's good and it's fun to listen to music on now and so we listened to the record last night and it's still really good that's awesome i, I love this band there's a we're video all of go them listen to this after. there was a a a series of concerts that so they only did a couple and i think it was called from the kitchen hmm. or something like that and there's a video of them playing a song 
and they're just in someone's kitchen and it's fucking tiny and them running into the shot it's just fixed camera there might be two cameras they cut between but them running in and the drummer like powering through all the instruments to get behind the kit and sit down is still one of the funniest things I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> and they did um, a video for the last song on the record, which is like a trippier, longer thing. And the front of that video is awesome. It's like they're in this van driving around being super cool in the van. They got the sliding door open and they're hanging out and they pass this car that's broken down on the side of the road with these two women there like who need help like they've got to change tires something and not because women need help just whatever this is what the video is mm -hmm. and they just blow right by them flexing their muscles and like check us out and just blow them off completely and then the song starts and, yeah. you know. <laughs> that's great but they're great they it's it's still one of my favorite records it just they're awesome so that was around the same time and that's act rights I have to Amazing. mention them because nobody's ever heard them. Like I get the digital, um, uh, you know, royalty statements every month mm. for the label. And it's like, you know, 13 cents. Oh like, my gosh, guys, let's, let's go fix this. They have 14 yeah, make monthly it listeners cent. on Spotify. It, at this rate, it's going to be like 4,000 years before I recruit the vinyl. And that's another <laughs> thing. I press 500 vinyl because that was the thing. I was always going to press vinyl yeah if we could afford it that's cool. and i'm like these guys are so good i'm gonna press the vinyl i made 500 and when i moved from la i had to throw out 400 uh, copies of the vinyl because they had no room for them i would right. i was gonna pay to ship mm -hmm. them and they're like we can't there's there's nowhere to put them so they probably went to landfill or something like that wow. but i got them one leg of a gogo bordello tour opening nice which was awesome. And it was one yeah. of those things where like I had to pay for bus tickets for them to get out there. And you yeah, know. yeah. But they were so good. So, wow. so good. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Let's all go stream that guys. Uh, the record is sweat equity. They have 14 monthly listeners. Let's go make it 15, 14, 14. So, so I'm getting one penny each though. That's pretty good. There you go. <laughs> they listen a lot. Yeah. Yeah, All and right. then there's an EP which came out afterwards, um, mm -hmm. which is really good. But I think the record is, uh, yeah, it's yeah. so good. Yeah, go listen to it. Yeah, and also never judge a, a record by the amount of monthly listeners on Spotify. That is all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, right. So, Andrew, we are at, uh, get away from me window. Hold on. Uh, we are at, we're going to be moving into AFI. However, I think this is going to be where we break and get to a little Q&A. All right. Is that okay? Well, AFI is really quick. I mean, I mixed okay. the record, which was cool. It was really fun. But the guitarist, uh, Jade Puget, mm -hmm. uh, for whatever reason, we struck up this thing where we would just go have lunch. And like he knew this amazing Thai place in the valley and we went there and like they had pineapples and stuff like really weird. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, we did it. I don't know. We must have had lunch four or five times and then we never had lunch again. But, you know, it was just fun. Like, that's, that's good. But there I, there's not a lot to say about the record. Mastering on that one was very difficult. The Yeah, this is no. I mean, you know, I have I have a hard relationship with mastering forever. And that was one of them. But, you know, it got done and it's a really cool record. Yeah. But Could we not talk about, about that? that? Mastering and Andrew Shep? No. No? Absolutely not. No. <laughs> My mixes are loud and mastering engineers want lots of room to do stuff. But I don't think much needs to be done. So I don't understand why I need to leave the room. So and it just becomes a mm. thing. It, sure. It's at the point. My mixes are, are quieter than they used to be now. Definitely coming off the console made my mixes quieter so mm. you know all right that's backwards from what everybody says um and they've been getting quieter and quieter over the years since then they're still loud uh but like act rights was uh mastered by a guy named brad blackwood who's great mm. and then the vinyl was cut by jeff powell who's a really great mm. friend of mine and he's got a cutting room at the Phillips recording Phillips. service, Sam Phillips yeah. studio. Yeah. Um, but with Brad, it was like, 
he sent the mastering and you know he hadn't done much at all mm. but i was listening to it and like no there's something there's something wrong like i don't have any idea what it is but it's not as exciting and mm. he was really cool and we kept going and we kept going and we kept going and he finally realized there was actually something wrong with the eq he was using like something was going on with the power supply or whatever but mm. it was really subtle but it was fucking it up and he totally you know he was cool and we fixed it and it was great but like i've had yeah. records where it's a, com a completely flat transfer and all they have to do is sample rate convert it and it's fucking it up and so right. i just use the sample rate conversion in pro tools which mm -hmm. sounds really good and i can tell you that i have done shootouts to sample rate converters when i was working on a chili peppers record with rick and we had to do that and mm. like it's yeah so whatever i mastering engineers don't want to deal with people like me and they shouldn't have to there you go awesome okay uh well very cool uh just checking through questions here yeah so i think that we um we've had a couple people ask about imposter syndrome we'll get to that in a second uh i think we should go to q a here because i have a, a whole lot of questions and okay. if we go too much further it's going to be like three questions you know yeah, so at this rate, we have two more episodes to come. We have two though. more episodes to go. Yeah. Unless, right. uh, wait, just, hold on. Are there any bombs? Let's ourselves inside? to that. And yeah. You got we'll try some, and make them happen some... a little more frequently than the last couple. Yes, definitely. Uh, we There's some big records in those. So those are going to be two, definitely two episodes. All right. And I feel like Black Sabbath didn't go on the list, did it? I just Something. added it, not necessarily okay. in any order. I just threw it yeah. up and I made it. And we've place. already talked about it a little bit, but there's there's still <laughs> yeah. some stuff. All right. All right, what you got? Questions. Here we go. Um, I'm just going to go random. So Joseph Music says, can you give any advice for newbies who want to go into Atmos mixing? I'm far down the rabbit hole and I need to upgrade my 20M2 home studio. Is it possible to upgrade Atmos on a wife acceptable amount of money? <sighs> Uh, that would depend on your wife. <laughs> um, Is it possible to I'm buy two Neve consoles on a wife acceptable? For, for years, um, we would get a piece of gear on our anniversary. Mm. Small, but like one year I got mm. a sample cell card. One year I got a CP70 piano. Like, mm. yeah. So, nice. yes, it's possible. It's absolutely possible. Um, the problem is it's not just a lot of speakers. You need the monitor controller. I mean, Mark's probably the one to talk to about this because you did that. I went through it. Yeah. Through it. I saved some money. Well, I don't know. That's, I used a monitor controller that, um, I can control with Yukon and I had a dock in front of me. So that helped coming out of the interface but yeah, yeah. i mean the, the problem is you can't like if you say nah don't worry about it i'll just use a fader in pro tools for my monitoring level or whatever mm -hmm. yes you can do it and that will save you some money but if you make something a pain in the ass you're not going to be good at it you're, all you're going to be doing is constantly scrolling to get that fader up but then your faders that you want to mix with if you use a controller aren't there and if you don't mm -hmm. use a controller now you're really fucked because it has to be on the screen and so i think you've got to have a monitor controller you need to um have i would say you could do 512 but 712 is really the smallest system you should do atmos mixing on just because you need to hear what happens on the sides you, you've got to know what's happening but also spend time in headphones get a personalized HRTF because then the binaural will work really well. Make sure that you are auditioning the Apple one as well because that gives you head tracking um, either through Logic or there are now ways to do it in real time, audio movers. And I think there's another one as well that uses that. Um, and if you're in Pro Tools or Logic or Cubase, there's a built-in renderer. So you can do it all within the one piece of software I've used the built-in renderer in Pro Tools and it works great. And you can go back and forth between a separate renderer and the built-in renderer. So I've got a, a separate renderer because my studio is ridiculous the way it's hooked up right now and there's Dante flying all over the place. But I can literally put the session on my laptop 
and open it up and put on a pair of headphones and I'm working with the internal render listening to the binaural. So yeah, the speakers need to sound the same. They don't need to all be the same, but same manufacturer, possibly different size. Um, yeah, and obviously the treatment in your room matters a lot more because you got sound coming from all over the place. So yeah, it, it is definitely possible, but you've got to be smart and you've got to put in some sweat equity, mm -hmm. as uh, the album is called, to make sure that you are aligning things properly, that your speakers are all at the same height, that your subwoofer is set up properly, because that can really throw off your low end if you're not hearing it. And I would say that the binaural representation of the subwoofer is really good. It's really good. As you turn something up in the subwoofer, it sounds like there's a subwoofer. So don't crank it because your room is small and can't reproduce the low end like my room. And then like, well, the binaural, whatever. Like it's probably right when that sounds mm. right in the binaural. Nice. Awesome. So um, the answer is maybe. <laughs> right, right. That, I mean, yeah, the, the physical setup of the speakers is... It's no joke. Yeah. Yeah. Because, yeah, I mean, even just getting the speakers, that's fine. But then you've got to mount them yeah. somewhere. Yeah. And get the yeah. cables to them. And, you know, and your room looks amazing. Thanks. Thanks. Um, the, I'm uh, glad yeah. you can't see my room. It's a fucking mess. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> you only see, like, a very small window of my camera. You right? just see the modular <laughs> yeah, and the exactly. bunch bob. And that's it. Yeah. It's perfect. Awesome. Uh, okay. Yeah, good luck with that, Joseph. And uh, Stryker says hi from Bavaria. There you go. Hello. Uh, <laughs> Steve Ward. Um, let's see. I'm going to put this up without reading the question first. Here we go. Andrew, since one of your main themes is that the song is always the main thing, what is your responsibility when the songs are not good as an engineer, as a producer, as a mixer, et cetera? Well, there are a few different answers to the question and I've stuff that I say a lot. One is that you need to make it as great as it can possibly be. If you're the producer, then you should be working on the songs and you try and find anything that's good in them and make it the focus of the song. You try and fix what you can, but again, it's only your opinion. Mm. It's not a fact. So, but I mean, you can tell when it's a new songwriter and there's stuff they're not getting and you you try as much as possible to do some pre-production and try and get the songs better. Mm -hmm. If you can't do that or you only get to a certain point, then you need to find something in the project that you can latch onto so that you care about the project. Otherwise, you have to not work on it. And that's a really hard thing to say when you need the money, especially if you're running your own studio and you got rent and you know the utility bills that go along with that you may not be able to do that all the time but you can't ever let yourself get the attitude of oh these guys fucking suck because now you're just going to do a bad job and the day is going to seem twice as long just like try and get the best sounds you can get for the song try and make it work get a tone you think is cool find like hey maybe this will be the time that we track without headphones like everybody mm. take your headphones off because it'll turn out one of the reasons the songs aren't good is that they're inexperienced and they've never really played outside of a rehearsal room. And the, one of the reasons they're playing like shit is because they're hearing everything too well and it's in headphones and they've mm. never done that before. Try with a click, without a click, like all of the stuff you can do and try and make them comfortable so at least you get a good performance of the song that you may think is not great. Mm. That's great. Um... I asked John Paterno that question one time and he was like, those are the sessions that are the most fun because you, um, you got to figure it out. So he's like, those are the ones that you go in, you try things like pull up a random mic and look for something that gets everybody excited, you know? And he's like, if not just for yourself or whatever, do something to get excited about it because that's your job is to be excited yeah. and all of that. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, Okay, the Philip Cast says thoughts on Sound Radix Auto Align Two and phase correlation software. Um, I've used it a little bit. I tend to get sessions with it on more than I put it on. 
Um, it seems to do exactly what it says. You know, as they say in the UK, it does what it says on the tin. Um, I don't really have thoughts about it. Like it works, but I never do it. Like I'll slide tracks around mm -hmm. and that's it. Um, I know like Daryl Thorpe is all about it and he's got a, a method to it and it's amazing. Um, and what I need to do is go back and watch that Foo Fighters video he did where he really goes through the process of it and like try mm. that. But um, yeah, I don't use it a lot, but it, I definitely, if I get rid of it on a session that had it, most of the time it's worse. Mm. So it, it does what it's supposed to do. Yeah. There's, um, I, I did a plug-in show on that one and um, also like, yeah, long conversations with Daryl about it. The, uh, it's changed a little since that Foo Fighters video because they have a auto align two now and it automatically assigns channels to itself, which you can change manually if you want to, but the, the process is much easier now. And then the cool right. thing that's in there is uh, if, it, if it suggests a certain amount of samples that it wants to offset to do an alignment with, it'll also give you other options. So for example, say that like you, you have a drum kit going and you put auto align on and before auto align, maybe the floor tom was like a little out of phase and it made it not as direct and in your face and it was nice. And then you put auto yeah. align on it and it's like somebody turned the focus dial on the camera and the floor tom is like perfectly in focus, but that's not the right thing for the song. You can go in and like try some different options until you get a little bit closer to what you liked in the original. Oh, right. Thing or whatever so it's well you can I, still I be creative with it which out. is cool because yeah. i mean like one of the things that people always want to align and it makes sense why you would is bass di and bass amp because the bass mm -hmm. di was recorded just speed of light whereas the bass amp has speed of sound in between the cone and the thing and it's late mm -hmm. it's always late but lining that up it usually doesn't sound good yeah so you know there you go. But yeah, I should definitely check out the new one and yeah. and see because I like that it will give you options like, hey, this is slightly more in phase, but not because it, it's a fuzzy thing. There's no mm -hmm. way it's like this is the absolute number. So I like the fact that they're like, OK, let's expose the other yeah. numbers. Yeah, they acknowledge like phase relationships are a creative choice. It's not about being correct or whatever. So that's yeah and, cool. and yeah. with a lot of things because of multiple things bleeding into one thing it can't be correct right right yeah okay uh let's see there is an adele question that we will save for next time here we go so gun love says greetings what advice do you have for studios with smaller room spaces i use drums and di for guitars but what approach would you take at this we talked a little I... bit about that on the earlier well, we talked quite a bit about it, I think, talking about the Duke Spirit record. And I think that I'm not sure what else I would say about it. I mean, I think having as few parallel surfaces as you can and not making the entire room dead, but cover up one of the parallel surfaces and leave the other one alone or break it up a little bit. And that'll give you a bit of a room sound, but get rid of, you know, slap echoes and waves and stuff like that um but yeah exactly the same thing you use di for guitars and then you can reamp them if the performance is great or sometimes the sound you get while you're tracking it's like oh okay well we'll stay with that because it worked like we got it so that the tracking could happen and now everybody likes that guitar sound so you know you don't always have to throw stuff away that isn't done properly whatever properly means because there's no properly um but i think yeah we we covered quite a bit of it with the uh in that duke spirit chat that we had earlier yeah great okay so next up david says is your template from pure mix who's that still relevant in your in the box workflow i noticed it's from 2017 question um yeah it probably is from 2017 so it's been updated a lot but it's still relevant. I mean, mm -hmm. the most of the parallel drum stuff, uh, the rear bus, like that stuff hasn't changed. Vocal effects have barely changed. Um, I've added more kind of level control to things. So now when I start my template, there's no parallel stuff actually up. 
It's mm. all all the way down. And I'm turning down the returns because the sends had settled out to the point where they were in a template. So the level mm. going in, I'm not worried about it. That's what the parallel chain will sound like. But I have to make a conscious choice to start bringing it in. And I usually do a little bit. But I mean, if you think that without the VCAs I used to control it, it was like the VCA was zero. And now if I get over like minus 17, that's unusual. So mm -hmm. I'm using 18, D, 18 dB less of the parallel stuff. So it's more about just how it gets used. And the mix bus, I'm sure that had uh, 33609 on the mix bus. There's no compression on the mix bus at all. There are a couple different EQs that kind of do different things. And then a limiter, uh, usually the um, newfangled audio, uh, is it Elevate? Is that the mm -hmm. limiter? 26 yeah. band limiter. And I don't get any gain out of it. It's just to control transients. Um, and then I also like the fab filter limiter every once in a while I use the DMG. Um, I can't remember the name of it, the DMG limiter. Uh, but yeah, usually the newfangled audio one and that's it. So it's actually much simpler and my mixes are quieter and a little more open than they used to be. And I seem to still be heading in that direction. Cool. Um, back to our earlier question in the Metallica world, if you wanted to simulate that style of, of mixing where you're really driving a console, what sort of things are you doing to, to get that in the box? Um, well, I don't ever think about it as driving a console, but I use harmonic distortion all the time. Mm -hmm. On my channel strip, I've got three flavors of it, well, four now, um, and I use that on stuff all the time. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah. And in that, in those cases, it was more about driving the individual channels versus pushing the summing amp or. Yeah. I mean, on the console, it was about the mix bus itself. It was how much mm -hmm. level would you put to the mix bus? But, um, sometimes it matters, you know, how much limiting is there? Cause the limiter has a sound, even though most of the time it's just on the kick and snare that you'll see gain reduction because parallel compression Oops, just slammed the microphone. Um, anyway, for all the reasons I've explained a million times, uncompressed kick and snare make it all the way into that limiter. So it's got to shave those off. So sometimes I will push that harder, but usually I'm trying desperately to back it off without losing too much. Mm. But limiters have a sound. I mean, people think of it as it's just level and that's bullshit. I mean, they have such a sound and every limiter sounds totally different. Every once in a while in a mix, I end up with an L2 because that had such a sound. And mm -hmm. it's like, well, none of the limiters I usually use are working because I usually use things that are the most transparent, but I need something with a sound and L2 absolutely has that. Mm. So, and it's the only dynamics processing on the mix. Cool. Very cool. Okay. Uh, limitless. DMG audio limitless. Oh, that's okay. Yeah. Very nice. Okay. W Frank asks, what do you think about software to simulate rooms on headphones? Like the one from waves with the CLA room or similar also using frequency correction software to make a headphone or monitor linear. Well, um, the room simulation thing in general i don't personally i just don't use it i don't like it i'm also lucky that i've got a really good pair of speakers in a room that doesn't really sound like anything mm -hmm. um so i can hear my speakers and that's great uh, a lot of people don't have that so i completely understand it and i think i'm kind of more open to the idea of it since having to mix listening to binaural and apple spatial versions of things which are trying to do exactly that um so i understand the need for it but i just don't really use it that much frequency correction software um i tried it when i was mixing on the sony's and because sony's have a crazy eq curve you know they're bright and they got to dip at 400 hertz and um, but it just sounded weird to me. 
and the workflow was weird. Like it would distort the shit out of the output. So I'd have to put a limiter after it. And then like, but then that's not my mix anymore. I'm limiting after the thing, but do I want to turn down the output of the limiter till the EQ isn't clipping? Like, no. So, you know, it, it was mm. logistically hard for me, but I have to say, and I think they might like that I'm going to mention this. So IK Multimedia have this thing called ARC. And it's been a software plugin only. And it's one of, you know, there, there are different companies that do it. They're one of them. But they um, are coming out with the Arc Studio, which is a hardware box. And you shoot your room the same way it does frequency sweeps through thing. And I, so my stereo is just shit I've had for a long time. It's a Marantz turntable from the 70s. It's a Macintosh amp that I bought a while ago, but it's again, 70s. It's just old stuff. And I've got my father-in-law's speakers from the late 60s, these Wharfdale things that just sound unbelievably great. Like mm. they're great, great speakers. And, but it just sounded flat. And my preamp is, it doesn't have EQ on it. Mm. So I built a tone control because I'm that kind of geek. <laughs> I spent a long time researching it and figuring out like what was i going to build and i built a two band tone control and then i was changing resistor values and capacitor values to pick the frequencies it was going to be at and i had mike Wamscans, the tech i mentioned before on the phone explaining to me that i'm a fucking idiot because i don't know how to actually put the support circuitry in for op amps and i breadboarded the thing and then i soldered it up and i put the power supply on it, and that's what i've been using for the last three years maybe so they sent me the arc studio and i told them i can't use it in my room because it's analog in and out yeah. it's aes to my front speakers and i've right. got the big pmcs i am not eqing them right. they sound fucking great and they it only does stereo so i said look i'm gonna try it in on my home stereo basically mm -hmm. but it's a really good system and if you're still interested i would love to check it out so i shot the room and there are lots of different methods for shooting the room you can do it with seven points or 21 points so seven on three different vertical levels and you can do it for a single listening position a slightly wide two person and i did like mm. the home theater one so you could be anywhere on a sofa cool it sounds fucking great i have retired my tone control Ah, and I never thought that would happen because when I've heard it on speakers before that kind of thing, it has always sounded like you put it through a shredder and then taped mm. it back together because even though for a long time they've been single filter, it always felt like it was a 60 band graphic EQ. Like there was something weird about it to me and I just didn't like it. This sounds great so i'm now mm -hmm. a big fan of it for what i'm using it for but that's why we we're listening to sweat equity like we listened i took most of the day off yesterday because i was waiting for mix notes on a few different things and i just listened to music most of the day which i really don't do very often because the last thing you want to do after working on music for 14 hours is listen to music so um but yeah we just sat and listened to records all day mm. And one of the things I listen to, other than Sweat Equity, which I just want to mention as an aside, is uh, the Chili Peppers record, um, I'm With You. We mm -hmm. cut 50 songs for that record. So there are a bunch of songs left over. And so we did a project where Josh Klinghoffer and I finished the songs. Anthony had sung them. Like everybody had played everything, but Josh hadn't done background vocals. There were guitar overdubs to do. And so we finished um, 17 of them and put out 45s mm -hmm. and but we did every like weird cutting thing you can do there's one that has a lot groove with audio in the middle there's one where side b plays inside out because we mm -hmm. rewired the motor on the lathe and cut it inside out like all this stuff and we listened to all nine of the 45s yesterday and it was fucking great that's and cool. some of those songs man i would say uh number eight which has um uh, this is the kit and brave from afar. Those might be my two favorite songs from that record. They're great. They're nice. really, really good. So I would recommend people hunt that down. I think it came out as I'm beside you. 
like as a joke because they weren't b-sides it was just like there were so many songs only so many could go on the record but i'm beside you i'm with you you know right that's yeah the, that's the conceit and if you get all 945s the artwork goes together to make one beautiful like circular uh, oh that's really cool nice yeah. So anyway, I really, really like the IK Multimedia Arc. It's the first time I've used something like that where I was into it. I've never used it to work through. Yeah. And I I, uh, I got to hear it as well. And I was really like pretty surprised what what came out. It was really good. It was really good. And the really cool thing is you can set, um, it will measure and the measurement doesn't change, but you set a target curve for mm -hmm. it to play back at so i've just slightly boosted the bottom end because i like a mm -hmm. lot of bottom end and it sounds great yeah fun thing too uh it has a phase linear mode but you can go you can turn that off and then you have zero latency so you can still track and then flip it back on that was oh that was right pretty cool yeah because so most natural, of those things i think that's what i'm on i think it's natural yeah yeah, yeah the other I, one's I phase like linear and causes a little delay and yeah which yeah. for me, I don't care because I'm listening to records, so it's right. fine. And it's not, not that much of a delay either, which is kind of right. scary. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's great. They're, that box is going to do quite well. Yeah. It's really, really yeah. good. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next question from Mel. Hi, Andrew. You've never talked about your personal A to D, D to A converter. What do you recommend? UA, Apogee, Burl? Or other. Other. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I've always been a huge fan of the uh, Avid DigiDesign and then the Avid converters. So I had 888s um, with an external clock, which mm -hmm. those absolutely needed. Um, then I had HDIOs or 192s. Then I had HDIOs, both of which I loved. And I love the soft clipping on those. Mm -hmm. And now I have a Matrix because I needed it for the audio routing that's going on. I mean, because I've got an insanely complicated studio with no patch bay. Yeah. And it works yeah. and it's great. So uh, those I have used uh, the UA and the the newer ones. I mean, it's a few years now. It was pre COVID when they came out, but the mm. like the X8Ps and that range of them, those A to D sound great. And I've used the Burls and I've used Apogee. Apogee's used to have a sound and I wasn't as into it as I like the Avid stuff, but obviously the Symphony stuff and beyond sounds really great. At this point, any good A to D sounds great. Mm -hmm. It's just about headroom on the analog electronics and that's where it might, you, you could cheap out. And I think the, the less expensive ones, that's where it is because most A to Ds and D to As are done on a single chip and most of those were made by one company in Japan that had a huge fire a few years ago. And that's why those chips are very hard to get. So the difference in the conversion itself is not gigantic. They are absolutely different, but it's not huge. But the analog front end and back end can be huge. Mm. So, but I think at this point, there's so many that sound good. Don't get hung up on it just like find something that works for you you put up a microphone like yeah okay fine and just get on with life mm. awesome all right next one from vernon elliott what's your favorite mix ever from you or from someone else <sighs> my favorite mix ever I don't know. I mean, it's really hard to say. Like one of the records I would always point out as being, I think one of the best sounding records ever is um, Oliver Nelson, Blues and the Abstract Truth. It's a Blue Note record from a long time ago. It's Rudy Van Gelder. And it just sounds like you're in the room. It's really incredible. Wow. Um, but it's not my favorite record musically, but it really does sound great. I think that I get more caught up in the music than the mixes. So sometimes mm. like it'll sound great. Like I, I still think that Beth Ditto song sounds fucking amazing. Like I can't believe I did that, but it's more how it feels going from one section to another. It's not necessarily cause it sounds great. Um, and for stuff I did, I'm also really proud of uh, the blue hour 
with Sharonova record, which I was nominated for a Grammy in the very unlikely category of Best Engineered Album Classical. Mm. But I, I love the way that record sounds, um, which is weird for me doing it. There's there are other things which I think just sound great, but they might even be weird sounding. Like I think um, the Genesis record, Lamb Lies Down on Broadway, mm. it's so powerful, but it's so clean and, you know, there's not parallel stuff going on and it's not smashed up, but like the bass tones are incredible. Peter's voice is so good. And like sometimes there are songs where every few words, there's a different vocal effect treatment on it. Um, which is something that also I saw like John Frusciante and Josh Klinghoffer both do that all the time. Mm. Like we would spend a couple hours on the lead vocal for a song, yeah. just finding like, what are we going to do to this, this little phrase? And it's amazing. And Bowie used to do that too. Um, so that record I think sounds great. Obviously dark side of the moon sounds great. Mm -hmm. Uh, I love the way revolver sounds the whole record. It's super cool. That sounds great. Um, yeah, but I don't know. I mean, these aren't hmm. going to be audiophile things, really. Well, this just uh, uh, reminded me that we never had you make an inspiration perspiration playlist, which yeah, cause for people good. who haven't seen the show, that was something that Andrew had all of his guests do. All right. Maybe all right. we... Yeah, 10 of we'll... each. So I'll do that. Yeah, sweet. I'm not going to do it right now. But well, just after we're done with this show is fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As long as I can get it in the next yeah. 20 minutes. <laughs> right, yeah. exactly. Awesome. Okay. Uh, let's go on here. Doing okay? Get a couple yeah. more in? Yeah, starting okay. to get, get a little loopy, but yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so there's a question about Fade Away. So, uh, Barakhan, I'm trying to get to your question here, but I'm not totally sure i'm understanding it so, so which record ask him because we were talking about killing bees and we were talking about something else and i feel like the killing bees album which we didn't we haven't talked about them yet well he says um maybe that's something that we should put on our list for for next time um Does he say what album it is uh no it just says can you ask a question about fade away i think it's very interesting the whole album is actually very unique i'm very curious about it um thanks you guys oh it's best. probably not the killing bees thing but i don't know um what were we talking about when i started talking about that uh i'm sorry i went blank on this one is he still uh, in let the me chat? know yeah let me know in the chat if you're if you're still here yeah just um, just do the uh because I have a feeling if I search on a music service for the song Fade Away, they're going to be a million. There might be a couple of those. Yeah. Uh, Oasis, okay. Crayon, Tom Walker. Logic. Uh, I'll ask you another random one here. Uh, settings for recording and mixing, 48K or 96? Uh, I don't know. People at the P&E wing of the Recording Academy probably won't like me. At this point, 48 Unless I'm doing something, you know, that needs to be more hi-fi in a way, then I'll go 96. But at this point, I don't have a problem with 48. The A to Ds and D to As are fantastic, like we've been saying. Um, and it just means I've got more horsepower on the computer, so I never even think about it. Whereas sometimes 96K, when you start putting in things like a 26-band limiter, mm -hmm. it, it starts to get to the point where like, ah, oh, shit, I got to dumb down the limiter to work yeah so um yeah i'm fine at 48k yeah there if i go. get something to mix it's at 44 one i will save a copy at 48 any other sample rate i just mix it at that sample rate i don't change it hmm. if it comes in at 96 i absolutely mix at 96 hmm. but if i have a choice i do everything at 48 how's uh how's your mac studio handling 96 are you ever having issues no. no, it's fine. It's fine. I'm going to be mixing some stuff right now that's 96, but I have my M3 uh, MacBook Pro, Ooh. Yeah. which is waiting in the wings for SoundFlow. There, there's like an Apple bug on Sonoma. And of course, you can't put anything before Sonoma on an right. M3. Right. So um, hopefully that's going to get sorted out sooner rather than later. And then I'm going to move over to that computer because one of the things 
I don't like is like I was just away for three weeks and it took me almost a week on and off to get my laptop synced up enough that I could take the mixes I had to work on while I was gone with me as opposed to pull a bunch of cables, lift the computer up and go. Yeah. That's, that's <laughs> the dream. And I used to do that. I, I, when yeah. I first moved over here, I was just on a laptop because I was yeah. traveling, but, um, yeah, so that's, that's the plan. I'll go from the Mac studio to the, the laptop. Cool. Uh, well, Transient Music Production says, thanks to you, Andrew. I'm in the box with my mixing. I had a lot of gear. Not anymore. Better for me and my mixes. All the best for both of you. Thanks. Well, I mean, it's it's whatever works. I've got no problem with gear. I just yeah. don't like to be told that gear is better than no gear because that's silly. But if you mm -hmm. have fun and it's great. But yeah, I, every mm -hmm. once in a while I think about like, oh, yeah, that was fun when I had this stuff. And there are a couple pieces of gear that like, oh that made that particular thing easy but you know would it still i have no idea and mm -hmm. i love everything else about just being in the box yeah like being able to pick up a laptop and walk out the door yeah that's pretty that's cool pretty good <laughs> um okay uh question where did you intern so uh we talked a little bit in part one about the your origins and everything but yeah that's the thing it's like didn't I never interned. Mm -hmm. I didn't work at a studio. I worked for New England Digital, who made the Synclavier, uh, which was a digital audio workstation long before there were digital audio workstations. Mm -hmm. So Soundscape was the first digital sampler thing ever, but that was in the 70s, actually. Like, who knew? Um, but yeah, so in the in the 80s, um, Fairlight waveframe synclavier and so that got me into sessions because it was used you know for music um but yeah i never interned mm -hmm. awesome okay so uh next question dr kev asks what project or album was the most difficult or frustrating to work on or with from a mixing engineering standpoint any stories come to mind you know i decided a long time ago that and nothing wrong with asking a question, but I, it's like people say, well, who is the worst artist to work with? And I just don't want to answer that because it's like that. There's no point in me trying to go. Ne like, there's no way to answer that question without going negative. True. So what if you don't mention the artist or anything like that. Just this one time. Well, on record. It, it would be one of the things that I worked on. All right. That's true. <laughs> That's very so good sorry. Point. I mean, it, it's. It's actually, it's an interesting question and I'm sure the answer would be interesting, but nothing comes to mind immediately as being like, oh my God, that was the worst. Um, I well, mean, actually good. I can think of, I can think of something that was the worst, but the last thing in the world I want to do is to bring it up again. So yeah. <laughs> cool. Don't live there. Uh, okay. Yeah. Another one from Dr. Kev. Do you keep all these books of notes throughout the year? Sounds like a storage issue if you do. <laughs> I did until I moved. Hmm. And then uh, a lot of the recalls went to the labels mm. um, just because, you know, if they wanted them and if they didn't want them, they got recycled. So uh, hold on a second. Where's my sound effect? But I didn't know the console. Line. That was very responsible of you to send that to the labels. I feel <laughs> like that was a Yeah, that was I mean, a good but, you know, thing. to be honest, so. usually it was the records I did with Rick where he has them now. Mm -hmm. but but they're useless like those recall notes sure. that console is no longer available and a lot of the outboard yeah. gear is never going to be in one room again like it they're not recallable yeah yeah although it's somebody you know 50 years from now and when, when atmos is no longer a thing and sound just radiates from the walls or whatever and they have to remix your record they might be happy if the recall notes are around for an idea or not maybe it won't matter <laughs> no I don't think it'll matter because yeah. AI will match it. Like, That's why true. would they be doing it yeah. really from pencil drawings? What am I thinking? We're not going to have music in 50 years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We never okay. did talk about AI. Well, that's good. That's going to be, I got two more for you if you're cool. Okay. For yep. It. Yep. Two more. First one, because you're going to be outdated by a computer. How do you combat imposter syndrome? We've talked about this on the show a few times uh, with you talking to other people, but yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't, I don't know how you combat it because I still have it every time I send a mix, every time someone calls me asking me to do something, I feel like I'm going to fuck that up. 
it's not going to go well. So you just work in parallel with it. it mm -hmm. I don't think you actually combat it. It's it's this the only way out is through again. Like you you just have to do the work, so you do it. You almost like in a trance, like you you zombie walk through it. Because if you let yourself think about that part of it while you're working, well, you're now you're fucked. You're never going to get anything good done. So I try to do the work for myself, um, you know, until I have to send it out. I'm just trying to make it great for me. I try not to worry too much about what else is going on. But you've always got the rough mixes, which now are not rough mixes. They're mixes. And so that's a battle. And that can add to the imposter syndrome because, you know, you start changing things and it's different. And that's the deal. It's different. So being different is not always a good thing. Um, so there's that. But yeah, you just have to blast through it. You, you've got to be as strong as you can and ignore it. I don't know that you can fix it because like Mark will attest in all the interviews we did, there were people who were exactly the same as me maybe not as bad, but they've got it. And the other people were like, well, what are you talking about? There was no like, oh yeah, I used to have it, but then I, you know, got over it. And like, I don't think you do. It's just part of the way mm. you deal with stuff. So yeah, just realize that it is what it is and, and send the mix anyway, you know? Yeah. Uh, zombie walks. That's such a great way of putting it. Uh, it I sounds just made negative. That up. Well, I've been zombie walking my way through this show, <laughs> well, <laughs> time, which is pretty obvious. <laughs> yeah. Which is basically every time I talk, all you're thinking is brains. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Or uh, question, next question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that no, seriously though, that um, that's really great, great advice. Just yeah. Uh, that makes a lot of sense for me because I struggle with it. And the only just, time to get through it is to just try and get it. over it. It's just going to spiral because you can't get over it and you'll start to think it's worse than it is and whatever. So it's just like the fact that I'm going bald. It, mm. you know, there's nothing I can do. So whatever. I don't, what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> If I look down, you'll know exactly what I mean. <laughs> okay. Not uh, your fabulous head of hair. I mean, it's a rug, but it looks great. If I take off, yeah, exactly. If I take off this rug, <laughs> you'll know exactly what I mean. I don't okay. You. Here we go. Hi, Andrew. What do you think about the AI stuff for music creation and supporting the engineering part? Okay. I got a lot of thoughts about AI, but I think that. Um, the first thing is to think about like AI generated music is mm -hmm. a completely different topic than AI tools for mixing. Yes. So uh, this latest low roar record, Ryan recorded everything sitting at the piano, piano and vocal mm -hmm. on all, but I think two songs he's singing while he's playing piano. Anyone who's ever recorded knows that, you get chocolate in your peanut butter and peanut butter in your chocolate. Like there's bleed on every mic of everything that's going on. So what that means is, first of all, your vocal sound is very diffuse, which might not be a bad thing. Like you were talking about with the Tom, like that could work, mm. could be fine because it's almost like a reverb on room mics on the vocal. Um, but if you want to do anything with it, tuning effects you can't just send that to a delay because now your piano is going to a delay like it's a fucking nightmare unless the album is just going to be voice and piano or possibly a few other organic things low roar records are not that there's mm. other shit going on and there will be other shit and there's a program called spectral layers by steinberg where i put these in and with some tweaking I have completely clean vocals and completely clean piano. And if I need it, I have just the vocal bleed from the piano mic separate and just the piano bleed from the vocal mic separate. So if I feel like, well, that was part of the vocal sound, I can put it in, but it doesn't have the piano in it. Like it's fucking crazy. That is all AI. 
I am so for that. I can't mm. begin to tell you. That's for a stereo record. Think about it if you get super basic stems mm. for something you're doing for Atmos. Yeah. Up mixers are cool, but not if you've got 16 sources in a stem and you want to be able to extract some things. So that use of AI is fantastic. All the isotope stuff that has AI is great. Um, the AI generated music, I don't know. I mean, I there was a guy at the audio developer conference in November. He's the one who did the thing where you could uh, go on the website and generate a Drake song with any subject you wanted. The music was not generated. Like they had done tracks, sort of like library tracks, but it generated a Drake vocal with video like it would do his mouth and he would say stuff and it was amazing you could have him do a song about your cat like it's incredible so the possibilities of ai are also quite scary because of course you if you charge money for that drake will well he'll come by and punch you out but hold on like, hold on there's... there's a question coming in andrew if this is from from pure mix <laughs> <laughs> um i don't know you gotta just look it up <laughs> okay. you'll find it i was gonna make a um, song about your show <laughs> yeah yeah you can do that and what what the really funny stuff was is he played the ones where it fucked up like it would mm. start glitching and he said they would all just stand around the computer laughing their asses off when it would do it wrong um so but the music generation in terms of the tracks i don't know i haven't really heard any that um i've heard like a couple of things that were generated completely whatever but i think that the tool set for people who are actually being creative is amazing it's like you know is it okay to model an amp mm. yes is it okay to model an la2a oh yes obviously you must do that so why would it be bad to use ai to help do that mm -hmm. Okay. Right. Um, then there is the issue of, and this is where a lot of people get upset. And I used to get upset until two days ago about mm -hmm. this. So when you're using, it's not AI, it's, it's machine learning. AI just gets to the point where it has got so much information that it makes decisions that you absolutely couldn't predict. And it'll be different every time because it's right. got so much stuff to pull from. And they all use, um, is it i think it's like language learning model it's an llm is the thing and it has training sets mm -hmm. so the training set is like a million pictures of cats and dogs and you start off by telling it that's a cat that's a cat that's a cat that's a cat here's a dog here's a dog here's a dog here's a horse which is neither a cat nor a dog and eventually it is picking apart what is similar in all these pictures. And it's not looking at it the way you are and saying, well, no, it's a cute fluffy thing. It's like the shape of the ears, the contrast between the nostrils and the nose. Like it's mm. stuff like that, that you would never in a million years pick out, but that's what it actually is because it's getting digital representation in pixels. Mm -hmm. It's not looking at the picture. And then eventually, with 99% accuracy, you get a picture and it says cat, dog, neither. Mm -hmm. And there you go. But the training sets are a big deal. So like you generated that picture. And where people go absolutely nuts is that thing is scraping copyrighted material. That's what it's yeah. training on. Mm -hmm. And that used to make me angry. Really, really angry mm -hmm. but here's the thing there's a guy i went to high school with who i first saw again after high school at south by southwest ran into him um and he is a lawyer and he's a music lawyer and he has uh worked with a bunch of tech companies over the last 10 years and he knows almost everything about it like he's so ridiculously smart but he's on the outside. So he's not just like what the technology is amazing, deal with it. Mm -hmm. And all the lawyers I've spoken to said all the copyright issues are going to be dealt with in litigation. Like there's no way Congress is going to pass a law that will deal with this properly because right. copyright got updated once since the 17 something or other. <laughs> like it's in the Constitution almost. Yeah. So. But the way he explains it is you're not generating 
a Renoir because you've looked at a bunch of Renoirs and now you're making a fake Renoir. You've looked at lots and lots of paintings. So think of it if it's a person. You go to museum after museum after museum and you draw and you draw. And one of the things they teach you as an artist is repaint the shit you're looking at. That's how you will learn. Copy, yeah. copy, copy, copy. These AI tools never even copy. So in terms of law and in terms of copyright and probably correctly, these things are just looking at paintings. They're not mm. copying them. If it mm. generated something that was like, that's the fucking Mona Lisa, there'd actually be something wrong with it. It would have way too much information about a particular thing to regenerate that particular thing. It's like the cat pictures. It's pixel organization and contrast and patterns. So the people like to say that the copyright thing is going to be huge. And I think he's actually right. Mm -hmm. It's just like saying someone has read a million books and now they can write in the style of lots of different authors. Someone, I like the people who do art forgery. That's a problem because they're painting a specific thing. Right. And selling it as if it's the real thing. Right. But if they're just painting in the style of... Then it's just new I art. I mean, what about Da Vinci, man? He painted like some small percentage of all the shit that was actually... I mean, it's all his work, but there are other people laying on scaffolding in the Sistine Chapel, painting the ceiling. He didn't do it all himself. Right. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe he did, but none. I mean, people get mad at Damien Hirst because he doesn't do all of his own stuff. Mm -hmm. It's all his work. It's just he's got people who help him. Right. And do tests. So there are a million different ways you can get mad about this stuff, but the AI version of it is the stuff that they're scraping is completely legitimate that they scrape it. They are merely viewing it the way a human would view it. And if they're coming up with exactly the same thing or they're doing a Drake voice or something like mm -hmm. that, then you're fucked. Then, right. yes, you sue them. Mm -hmm. um, because there's also something called right to personality and that yeah. is your likeness and your voice and things like that and you own that by default the same way something is copyrighted as soon as it exists in your mind mm -hmm. you don't have yeah. to send stuff to the copyright office by the way that's mm -hmm. not a thing um so what was there was one more thing i was going to say about that um but i don't remember what it is there's a book um while you're thinking of that, uh, from I think the author's name is Austin Cleon. Uh, it's called Steal Like an Artist. It's a really, really fantastic book, but it's it's mostly about like how to draw inspiration from from things. Um, where it's I don't know. It's it's sort of getting over the hump of like, well, I can't do that because that sounds too much like this, so I won't even go down the road. And it's kind of saying like, no, you should absolutely explore that road because by the time that you're done with it, it probably will be nothing like that anyway. And that's kind of the concept and. Oh, yeah, I mean, I, I think yeah. that what we'll come to find out is unless it's badly done, mm -hmm. AI will be more different from the stuff it looked at to learn things than humans. Yeah. It's looking at way more stuff, like exponentially more mm -hmm. stuff. And it doesn't carry enough things. Like if you could look at a thousand paintings, but if there's one you really, really, really love, first of all, you're going to look at it a lot. Second of all, you're going to remember the shit out of it. These learning models, every single thing is just as important as every other thing. Right, right. So you don't There's have no this like, ooh, it's my favorite, and I'm going to make more and more stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Humans copy songs all the time. Um, the same guy who was telling me about the AI thinks that the, the Robin Thicke lawsuit was actually a travesty. Like, you can't do that. Hmm. Whereas any, two, any human listens to the two songs, and like, you've got to be kidding me, it's the exact same groove. Exactly the same. Mm -hmm. But... Anyways, but that's the copyright thing. The other thing I was going to say is that all of the AI tools are only as good as their training sets. And you need to have a good training set. And I think mm -hmm. that possibly there's going to be an entire growth industry for music of people putting together good training sets. And that could be a job to actually mm -hmm. get stems of things that are going to be useful to be trained on. Because there are a couple of people I know who've managed to hear training sets for some of this stuff. 
and it's shit. Like yeah. it's bad. So that's a thing. Right. Um, hold on one second. I'm, uh, You're doing something funny, obviously. Don't worry about it. <laughs> okay. Uh, so. And I want to say I'm actually very surprised at my willingness to accept the fact that the way they scrape material is not actually copyright infringement right. at all. Not even right. close. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, there's there's so many implications with that. So, OK, we get over the point of copyright. Now there's so many conversations to talk about in terms of uh, what, like, if it can, you know, if it can code for me or if I can generate that image, then I'm not going to go to Fiverr to generate the burrito picture for the Andrew live stream. Or, you know, there's so many conversations there, too. Right. But, well, but this is also the, you know, the the fifties version of the future was we were all going to hang out and robots were going to do everything for us. I know. And where are those? I want <laughs> Exactly. Well, they're building cars, <laughs> you know, yeah. like there've been, there've been these innovations that put people out of work for right ever. Uh, you could go you know, back to the horse and buggy, you know, nobody's making yeah, those technology anymore. puts people out of work. Right. Or horses out of work. Like right. <laughs> it, it's, it's just what happens if you advance as a thinking thing with the cortex like, mm -hmm. you know, there are species of animal that use tools. I don't know that they're yeah. putting anybody out of work, but you use tools to do work that you can't do yourself. And then when you're humans, you come up with ways that the work can just do itself in a way. Right. You know, you invent the thing that can do the work. Do you know anybody but, who's done that? What? Who's actually <laughs> invented the thing? Well, he's made something that can do work I feel for like, you. I feel like you know, there sleeping. are a lot of assistants who no longer work. <laughs> right. That was a lot of people got mad about Bounce Factory because yeah. they're like, well, we're going to put assistants out of work. Like, no, they yeah. can just do other stuff. Yeah. You know? Right. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, yeah. I mean, that's a very good example of an unbelievably great. That's nice. I like that a it's horse a, an ass. Sounds straight. Yeah. <laughs> I made that for you <laughs> just now. Thanks, man. I, I'm not sure if you like it, but that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> I'd say the Bounce Factory is one of the more ethical things that takes jobs away from yeah. kids. So, well, and yeah, yeah I, I mean, mean, we talked about this. Like, it's not, you know, go do something that makes you more valuable. It doesn't, well, I don't exactly, think that like printing stems overnight, is your whole job. Overnight, people who knew how to write prompts for ChatGPT became like a six to seven figure salary job. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Hold on. It's second. easy to be a Luddite and it's easy to like wish for the old days. But I think if you actually went back to the old days, there's other stuff that really sucked. Mm -hmm. Like the 70s smelled bad. You know? <laughs> I, I wasn't there. You don't know. Unfortunately. You weren't there. Yeah. <laughs> it smelled bad. There you so go. What did it smell that. like? Just bad. Just bad. Yeah. Bad. Um, to like one more thing on the the fun of AI. Actually, uh, I I think it'd be cool. Like, have you used? You've used a bunch, I'm sure. You have to be a very into this. Is my guess. No. Uh, what you just said though, like the power of using something like ChatGPT is in the prompts. So if you are interested in it, um, watch some videos on how to prompt it or learn how to prompt it. Uh, yeah. Because it's not just like remembering it's a conversation it remembers the conversation i can go back to conversations i had two months ago with it and it has all the knowledge from that conversation and i can continue yeah look um, i yeah. i know a guy who well look at what uh what pro tools did so now they've added um i can't remember if it's that or not but they talked about it so i, I can talk about it because it was at a presentation at that audio developers conference mm -hmm. where they fed a learning model the reference guide to pro tools and then they fed it one other set of things oh the scripting sdk which mm. is something you're you can use to program pro tools and now there's a little AI bot just for creating sessions you go hey give me a session with this many auxes and name them like this and this and it just makes a new session for you yes <laughs> you know i want it it's so that's fine it's getting rid of something that nobody like enjoys yeah so like bounce factory 
which is one of the best uses of coding ever. There's no AI involved. It just puts people right. out of work. Right. Actually, there's another point too. AI is not just a bunch of if, if then else statements, right? So it's no, exactly. I mean, that's what the difference is. And that's why yeah. it used to be that there was machine learning and then it could be massive. And then AI was something different. AI would be something where it could create from scratch. But I think they've redone the, demo, the definition because the models, the learning models have gotten so big that it seems as though it's creating it from scratch because you can make no correlation to a specific bit of input. Mm. And it will do the same thing differently every time. Um, so yeah, I mean, AI is just that. It just knows so much more than any human could ever know that it can draw conclusions and make shit up. But what about like the writer's strike? that was ended when it was decided that script writers were allowed to use AI to punch up their scripts, but studios were not. And like, I get mm. it, but in a way, like, are you fucking kidding me? Right. That would be like saying last. only yeah. only chauffeurs can drive cars. I mean, yeah, I only want a licensed pilot to fly a plane. But that's like saying only certain people are allowed on planes. Like that's the thing. It, it's it's weird to me and I get it. And I'm sure there would be an explanation where it would make more sense to me than it does now. Mm -hmm. But that's just, that's just weird. I mean, why wouldn't the writers say, fuck that, you can't use it at all. Not we can use it, but you can't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is This is good. <laughs> yeah, if we could decipher the stuff that I say, that would be good too. Uh, for the My podcast, my pads people, are not uh, that crazy. They're not right. crazy. Just Let me do a sand. VO for the podcast, guys. Uh, it's a user DMK75 says AI would be great if it could decipher Andrew's signal paths. So, <laughs> very nice. Nice. <laughs> All right. Cool. We did it. We did it. We've we still got it. at least two to go. Yeah. Um, last time we figured out the next date on air. I think okay, this time we should text. That. Or you want to do it? Okay. All right. Yeah. Here we go. <laughs> Thanks for great streaming. Uh, March 4th. Oh, fun thing too, guys. Um, for this show, I, uh, didn't, I was a bad, bad guy and I didn't write off where we, or write where we left off last time. So I used chat GPT four with the plugin and I told it, go watch this video and write me an outline and tell me all the records that we talked about. And I yes. still managed to repeat myself. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's good, useful stuff. Okay. March 4th is perfect. Let's do it. Okay. Two weeks from today. Two weeks from today. That'll is that right? Wait, is it two weeks? It is. Yeah, it's two yeah. weeks from today. Perfect. Yeah. It's in my calendar. Okay. Might as well. Super. Cool. There we go. Guys, we'll see you in two weeks. <laughs> nice. Very nice. And we'll figure right. out what, what album Fade Away was on. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. You sh can right. you get in touch with that person and find out? Because I'm actually intrigued. Um, actually, if you just hang with me for two more seconds, I can search the uh, comments here. So it was I can I can hang with you. Break. I think I can uh, hang with you guys for a minute. <laughs> okay, so fade away dash maybe tomorrow. It was a guitar demo, but in the album, everything evolves around his voice and it's very cool. Would love to hear about the process and any special effects. Thank you. Oh, the, the low roar song. Ah, right. Yeah. That makes sense because he, okay. Hi. A few months ago, I heard fade away as a guitar demo in the album. It's very different with lots of granular things. How did that happen? Any special effects or processes for granular things? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, Mike does lots of stuff and then I did lots of stuff. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it, it's, it's just how we make those records. I don't remember specifically stuff that went on on that song, but, um, Oh, 
I understand what he's getting at. Okay, sorry. Uh, so he also says, will there be any detailed talk for Maybe Tomorrow or House in the Woods in the future, uh, like Low Roar Part 2 or something like that? Um, well, didn't I talk about Maybe Tomorrow? I must have. I, I, you cut, I, yeah, I you, the session. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah, I don't know. Did. I think he's just wondering if there would be a Part 2. And he says, um, th- uh, this makes me think that I'm listening to pure art, not music. So just a compliment. There. Well, I appreciate yeah, that. Nice. Um, yeah. yeah, I actually spent all day today working on Album 6, which apparently everybody knows is called House in the Woods. So, mm. um, yeah. So I did spend all day working on that. It's still, it's slow. Mm-hmm. Um, there's stuff I need to work out. I- I'm, Yeah there i think there's strings that are needed and so i'm logistically trying to figure that out mm-hmm. um but it, it's yeah it's difficult because it used to be really easy to just i just i wouldn't play him anything i just have a conversation with ryan and like ah, i think i might do this and he go fuck that do this and then you just <laughs> do it and it, it made things sort of easy and i'm having to have those conversations in my head now and you know it, i'm wrong i'm sure i'm wrong so I'm having to try a lot more stuff instead of just blasting through, which is what happened a lot on the other records. Um, but yeah, we can do we can do another show on that, you know, because awesome. I, I do I, I'm feeling pressure from myself to get over the hump on the record. And it's it is getting there. It's definitely getting there. But I won't I can't promise anything. And I know there's some people who are super impatient. Uh, but nobody was as impatient as Ryan. So no matter how impatient you are, just know that whatever. Um, and once the record is done, you know, it can't come out immediately because mm-hmm. we have to do a promo and press thing because obviously there aren't going to be any shows. There's going to be no support other than that. So we have to set the record up properly because I really want people to hear it. Mm-hmm. Um, so and that takes time. So I do apologize in advance because everybody is going to hate me even more than they already do because it took me over a year to even be able to start working on it. So, you know, Nothing whatever, but it, it's in yeah. progress. Awesome. Yeah. I can't wait to hear it. <laughs> it's going to be good. But you got the other five records and a live record and an EP and a remix. I want that, that one. <laughs> Which one? The one that's not done yet. <laughs> Yeah, you're exactly. like, but there's all this other stuff. It's not what I asked. Yeah, <laughs> if, if for anyone listening who likes Little Roar, if you haven't checked out the live album, that's definitely worth doing. It was mm. a beast to try and do anything with it after we had it recorded, but it's a great show. And Amina, the string quartet, is playing live, and it's um, yeah, it's really good. Awesome. There you go. Very cool. All right. Yeah, we'll have to have to figure out if there will be more low roar talk too um there were all kinds of questions we didn't get to guys thank you so much for being active in the chat room today too there was uh we had you know a, a couple requests for more between two shares come in in there uh, i'm all about that but yeah it kind of has to be shot at a trade show because we need everybody to be in one place yeah and everybody's that was really amazing. busy at trade shows right we shot that all in two days all of those yeah. episodes in two days over there. That was crazy. And a lot of fun. Yeah. Especially yeah, but it was nuts. I mean, because you guys had a you guys had a party in the suite while we were filming we were the second Finishing day. the other ones. Yeah, it was ridiculous. We worked it into. <laughs> and there's still a couple that haven't come out, I think, but I don't know if they ever will, because I, I mm-hmm. can't remember what state they were left in. But we'll we gotta do another set. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. Um I, I can <laughs> certainly be that mean again. Right. <laughs> You'll find a way. Yeah. Yeah. Oh man. We gotta find a new spin for it. So <laughs> Do we? Maybe not, actually. Yeah. I just need new people or or just follow. No, maybe you're right. We gotta mix it up. We'll figure something out. Yeah. All right. I guess we can do that off air. <laughs> All right. Cool. Well, I'll see you in two weeks. Sounds good. Thanks everybody for watching. Uh, we really appreciate Thanks. it. All right. We'll see you guys next time. All right, bye.